This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 673, recorded on October 16th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Boy, the weeks go by, don't they, Daniel? It it's actually amazing. It's amazing how <laughs> quickly uh, you, you you and I I sign off with you, and then boom, it seems like there's so much that immediately happens, and we're back back here again. Looks to me, Daniel, that case numbers are going up not only in the U.S. but globally. Uh, you know, I was joking with the uh, with the people in the ICU today that, you know, the Europeans are trying to beat us. Apparently they've got, (laughs) we're not going to let the French do it this time, nor the Italians. Um, No, it's, it's really unfortunate. Um, You know, it's sort of, you know, a a pit in my stomach when I I see the numbers, Um, you know, when I hear the numbers and then I actually see them firsthand. I mean, we have um, well over a hundred admissions at the Northwell hospitals now. Mm. Um, you know, the, the numbers are rising. They're rising in Europe. They're slightly ahead of us as they were the last time. Um, but we were sort of a, we were an outlier, right? We were the ones who were on our way up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everyone else was, um, you know, sort of getting it under control. But now they're just, just like us. They're having that same, that same trajectory. And they're even a little ahead of us. Do you think it's a combination of back to school, cooler weather and complacency as far as face masking and distancing in, is involved? You, you know, I, I think these are interesting comments. Um, you know, when we talk about back to school, you know, and my wife brings this up quite a bit, um, the schools themselves have, have tried to do certain things, you know, along the lines of uh, separating the desks and masks. Um, and so I don't know how much transmission necessarily goes on within the building, you mm. know, within the school. But when you have returned to school, it sends a message to the community. And I'm going to share one of these stories. But they start having birthday parties. They start having get-togethers. Oh, let's get everyone in the class together. And then those extracurricular activities that really are triggered by the message that, to be honest, that the schools are sending, um, that's where we're seeing the cases. Mm. So um, we'll discuss a couple of cases um, we dealt with this week where birthday parties, weddings, all these gatherings. So yes, I do think it's it's the school reopenings. Um, you know, they talk about, oh, well, we're not having transmission within our walls, so we don't need to test. Yeah. Um, that's, you know, I, I think irresponsible. Um, you know, you're part of a community schools. <laughs> so just because it doesn't happen within your walls, the fact that that sets up a societal um, expectation, a societal view of, of what's permissible because this um, signal that they're getting. Um, so that, yeah. And then, you know, you look around, people are done with the virus, right? The virus isn't done with us. So people mm-hmm. are relaxing. They're they're not wearing masks. They're, they're getting together um, and having dinner with people they haven't seen in a while. And this is a problem. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. My wife was just telling me um, close friends of ours that we you know, haven't spent a lot of time with recently. Um, we're just about to have um, drinks um, tonight, but then they found out that those people they're about to have drinks with oh, apparently are are PCR positive. Um, so you know, it's just yeah. Mm. All right, let's get right into your COVID nineteen report. Okay, let me start with my quotation: um, "In a dark place, we find ourselves, and a little more knowledge lights our way." This is uh, this is Yoda. I don't know if people have ever watched Star Wars or heard. It's a George Lucas film. It was popular. Um, And, uh, you know, I I like to feel like this is a place where people can come and as dark as it gets at times, as dark as I feel like it's becoming as we see these rising numbers. um, Hopefully this is a place where we can um, share a bit of the knowledge. And also, you know, hopefully I can give that optimistic spin that we are learning things. We are moving forward. So. Um, let me let me start with our patient updates. People always like to hear a little bit about that. So, um, you know, this will be the good, the bad, and I'm going to leave out the ugly. Um, but the good news, um, our lady who contracted COVID from her daughter um, is waiting to go home. She, she made it through. Um, she had her first... 
PCR negative today. And then hopefully tomorrow after 9 a.m., I was on with Perna Shaw, one of the hospitalists I'm working with. And, and she's like, she's negative. I'm like, no, no, we need a second. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. she's going to go to a, a skilled rehabilitation center. And we're really careful to protect those individuals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she needs a second. needs to be a little more than 24 hours apart. So um, that's great. Um, but then I had um, another patient, and this was, as mentioned, the party. Um, her 10-year-old grandson was having a birthday party um, because, you know, it's all good. We're back at school. It's, you know, and uh, she went to that birthday party. No one wore masks, right? He's 10 years old. So none of the kids were wearing masks. None of the girls were wearing uh, masks. A um, couple days later, I think this is, I want everyone to think about the timing. So, Um, the birthday party is on Sunday. Mm -hmm. About three days later, she sees her primary doc who says, you went to a party, let's get a test. The (laughs) test is negative, you know, can wipe our brow, we miss that bullet. Um, Four days later, she starts feeling sick. Uh, How can that happen, right? You know, as as we know, you know, uh, a a negative test predicts the future. No, (laughs) she was still in the (laughs) incubation period. Um, So then she has her positive test. And I'm now, you know, taking care of her in the hospital. She's a woman in her 80s, and um, hmm. we'll see how she does. Um, this could be other, a, could you know, be a super spreader event, right? She's not going to be the only one infected. Yeah, that's um, that's what we worry. And we just had a, another nice birthday party here in my local area, um, and this was uh, older brother had um, had a fever, right? So they sent, you know, they sent off one of these PCRs. Mm -hmm. Um, It didn't go through our system. So apparently there was a several um, day delay. The test was done on Thursday. Uh, They got the results Sunday afternoon, about an hour after the younger brother's uh, 20 child birthday party. (laughs) So um, and it rained. Fortunately, it rained this. this, And so um, that child then actually um, was... um, then tested. Turns out the younger brother also is positive, um, and he just had a had a birthday party. And mm-hmm. since it rained, the twenty other children, all the parents, everyone crowded inside the house for that for that birthday party. So, um, yeah, yeah, you, you you cringe and and I cringe too. So, um, but I, I think there's a couple lessons here. Is one is you know. I know it's raining. I know it's a birthday party, but you know, tragedy when this, you know, this grandmother, you know, is down in the hospital and just think about all those kids and all the parents and and people that they um, might get exposed to. So um, that's our updates on some patients. Um, But now let's hit some news. Um, I don't know if anyone heard, but the president is now not infectious and he is immune. So I've been yes. asked. To- <laughs> yes, I was going to ask you about that, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just let's just hit both topics. Um, so let's talk about in- infectious, and you're going to enjoy this. So, um, you know, there were a couple things that came out, um, you know, that were the basis for the president's not infectious, and they, and they told us there's several reasons why people believe that's true, um, and I'm going to weigh in on that here. Um, so one was they said, oh, it's it's more than 10 days into the course of his illness. Um, so now 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 we now know that, yeah, he was sick for a little longer than you know we were initially led to believe um, when we get that. Um, he also we were also told that he had two negative rapid antigen tests using the BD Veritor system. Um, and uh, just to give people a sense, the rapid antigen tests turn positive when an RNA copy is 50,000, RNA copy number is 50,000 or higher. That's going to be at about mm-hmm. our equivalent to a CT value of 30. Um, so we were told he, he seemed to have a level below that. Um, and we were also told that this was consistent with um, his RNA um, PCR CT value, right? Um so this is what I'm, I'm going to say was um, somewhat entertaining, right? So I was actually having a discussion with Apoorva Mandavilli. She's mm-hmm. one of the New York Times um, reporters, journalists, um, actually quite a bit of a star, right? She was the 2019 winner of the Victor Cohn Prize for Excellence in Medical Science Reporting. I sent her um, your way, Daniel. Oh, okay, great. And so <laughs> um, actually, and thank you. Yeah, she was, um, it was very entertaining to talk to her. So I'm talking to her and, you know, she published an article back in August, your coronavirus test is positive, maybe it shouldn't be. Um, 
And so I'm having this conversation with her about this issue. And I say, they told us that the CT value is um, consistent with him being not infectious. And I said, but we haven't been told the CT value and I would love to know the CT value. Mm -hmm. And so she says, oh, you know, I know the CT value. I just got off the phone with Anthony Fauci and he told me. (laughs) So I was like... Okay. (laughs) I would love to know what that was. And so she shared it with me. And apparently the CT value was 34.3. So two things. One is Anthony Fauci can actually get those CT values, unlike me. Um, Hmm. And if you look at a CT value of 34.3, that really means you have an RNA copy number of less than 4,000. So on the TWIV, when Anthony Fauci was on it and, and he was asked this question, he said, anyone below 35, Um, you know, or I should say a number higher than 35, a CT value showing an RNA copy number of less than that. They're not infectious, 34.3. I mean, that's, you know, we're rounding up a little, but it's true. Um, I I would say that when you look at the combination of a negative antigen test, so less less than 50,000, a um, CT value on your PCR of 34.3, that's down at about 3,000, I'm going to say. Um, the fact that they tried to do the viral culture um, and couldn't do it, you know, and they did it in a BSL-3. And anyone who works in a BSL-3 knows what they're doing. I mean, these are well-trained individuals. Um, so I, I think everything put together, um, it's reasonable to agree that he has passed that infectious zone um, and actually hopefully is a learning experience for people. They're going to hopefully start sharing these CT values um, so we can do similar things. Um, the woman that I'm now requiring to have two completely negative Um, PCRs, um, it might be fine to say two negative PCRs, but we're going to shift that um, that cutoff to 34 cycles, something like that. Okay. But Daniel, is he immune? (laughs) That is the second, and that is actually the most interesting. And again, thank you for sending a poor of them my way because um, she she knew stuff that actually takes me like about a day to get. (laughs) So let's go here. So a couple of issues. And first, just thinking this through. Um, considering the president got remdesivir, he got the two monoclonal antibodies, which if people want to learn more about, about the Regeneron products, uh, listen to the most recent TWIV, where this is really sort of discussed uh, in depth. Um, so he gets remdesivir, monoclonal antibodies, and then he gets steroid. So his response to the natural infection was blunted, mm-hmm. right? So he did. And then a Porva tells me, because she's all knowing apparently, when he got the Regeneron product, he had none of his own antibodies at that time. Hmm. So he was serology. So they really gave him these products before he had a chance to start mounting um, his own antibody response. Um, So he may not develop a a robust, um, his own robust natural um, response to the infection. Um, which in a sense is good, right? Because a lot of the problems we run into with COVID-19 is not the virus, it's the immune response. So they've, they've blunted that, meaning he probably is not immune. Now, the antibodies he got, um, they have a certain half-life. And while they're at a high level, and, and I think Alan Dove did a good job of sort of pointing out, like while 10% of all the immunoglobulin in his body is the these monoclonals, he is temporarily probably protected. Um, but these have a half-life. So, and the half-life ranges from, again, a poor knew the half-life of all the antibodies. And I've been working with Lily a little bit, and it took me like a day to find out the half-life of their different monoclonals. Um, but anywhere between 20 and 27 days for the different monoclonals that are being studied by the different companies. So 20 days from now, he's at half that level. Another 20 days, he's down to a quarter. So Each 20 days, he's dropping his level of immunity. Um, Unlike a natural infection, which we think may give you immunity for longer than these 20-day drop cycles. Okay, so he's not immune. (laughs) He is not immune. He is temporarily protected, it seems, Mm -hmm. um, from the antibodies he got. But we may have actually prevented him from developing natural immunity. But Daniel, Um, maybe he got a vaccine. (laughs) 
uh, of this, I don't think we have any uh, knowledge. Uh, so he, yeah, he did get know. he did get things that uh, few others are getting. So who knows? Right? That's you know that's true. But that also brings us, I guess, to the other um, the other interesting topic that was discussed most recently on uh, TWIV is even if you get a natural infection and it's not blunted, can you get reinfected? Mm -hmm. And if you get reinfected, is that second infection, you know, mild or perhaps worse than the first infection? Um, And so, you know, Lancet Infectious Diseases just published genomic evidence for reinfection with SARS-CoV-2, a case study. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually I got email from a buddy of mine, Bill Tam, um, who's a retired physician over in um, England that I actually worked with in, in Baduda in Uganda. Um, and you know, apparently this got people in the UK talking about this issue too. Um, the first infection in this case was documented with a positive PCR April 18th, but then a second test on June 5th with a genetically uh, different variant mm-hmm. um, was documented. This was 48 days later. I looked at, I did the math here, looked on a, <laughs> looked on a calendar, something like that. Um, the first infection was mild, but the second infection was severe. Yeah. Um, and I think it was Kathy who pointed out of the four documented infections so far, half of them were worse the second time, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, our statisticians will kill me if I say 50% were worse the second time, but yeah. I'm those not extrapolating. Not, those are not numbers you want to <laughs> hang your hat on, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an N of four, and I'm going to predict the future, but... Uh, yeah. And then, you know, so this is a little bit, uh, you know, so is the president immune? Am I going to hang my hat on that? Should he stop wearing a mask and not worry about it? Do people around him, they don't have to wear a mask anymore because now he's immune? No. Um, you know, continue to take the virus seriously. Um, let's see what else I have to say here. Um, you know, there was a, there was another sobering report. This was from the Netherlands, which was, um, at this point, it's not peer-reviewed, but it was reinfection of SARS-CoV-2 in an immunocompromised patient, a case report. Um, here, the woman was reinfected. Actually, she died the second time, um, mm. which is worse than what happened the first time. Um, but you know, this was 59 days um, after the first infection. She did have underlying issues. She had Waldenstrom's, which is an issue with B cells. Um, so she wasn't a completely healthy person. So mm. um, that's, yeah. So that so would be a good candidate for monoclonal therapy, right? That so perfect candidate. So with Waldenstrom's, we actually use a therapy that depletes the B cells. Mm-hmm. So here's someone who doesn't have the ability to make um, her own antibodies. Perfect candidate to be given um, the the passive um, immunization or the passive vaccination, however we want to word that. I'm thinking we should word it. Um, immunization because we have anti-vaxxers, but we don't have anyone who's anti-immunization. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So let's see. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is just to give people a sense of, um, you know, a lot of people are talking about, well, you know what? It looks worse in the U.S. because we're testing so much. That's why it looks like we have so many cases. Um, but there's one thing that... Um, testing doesn't really get rid of or make happen, and that's mortality. Um, So there was a research letter published in JAMA, COVID-19 and excess all-cause mortality in the U.S. and 18 comparison countries. Um, You know, early on um, in the start of the pandemic, um, there was a pretty high um, mortality really everywhere. Um, A lot of people got it under control, um, and they do COVID-19 deaths per 100,000. Um, so in the start of the pandemic, we had 60 per 100,000. Uh, Belgium was struggling with 86.8. The UK had 62.6. Um, since May 10, once we sort of started to get things, and then they even go out to since June 7th, what has the rate been per 100,000? And who are the outliers? Um, the US is at 27.2 per 100,000. Sweden is 10.3, where Italy is down at three, France is down at 3.2. So since since we've sort of, um, you know, known that this is going on, um, there's been a high mortality, high, and this is not testing. Testing doesn't make people die of COVID-19. Testing actually, (laughs) I'm going to argue, is going to keep people from dying um, from COVID-19. And uh, there was a bit of a shout out for this calculator that we developed. And actually, um, people can go to Parasites Without Borders to the COVID-19 update um, 
part of our web page. And actually, they can go and they can look at, you know, how you can use different testing strategies to prevent infections. Um, we finally got our paper out there. And yes, I, I did. It's on a preprint server. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I was involved in the discussion, but it was not really my idea at the end, but I, I went along with it. But um, identifying optimal COVID-19 testing strategies for schools and businesses, balancing testing frequency, individual test technology and cost. Um, Michael Minna's website, rapidtest.org, has a link to it as well. Um, so okay. hopefully we're... We're giving people information to help guide them so they can use testing to prevent infections, prevent deaths. An update on um, treatments. Uh, A couple things came out. Um, We got finally the final report for remdesivir for treatment of COVID-19. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, And we really saw very similar results compared to the preliminary report, but now we have follow-up out to 29 days. Um, There was a statistically significant shortening of hospital stay, uh, a trend towards lower mortality, but not reaching statistical significance despite, you know, enrolling over a thousand patients and follow up. Um, It's open access. So um, people who are not driving or maybe can put this uh, later to do, um, go ahead and take a look at the article and look closely at figure two and three. Um, you know, just sort of figuring out who who are candidates for remdesivir, who gets the benefit. And it appears that the therapy is most helpful for patients under the age of 40. Sort of interesting, mm-hmm. right? Um, patients with less than 10 days of symptoms prior to receiving drug. That goes along with our phases that we've discussed. Um, patients receiving oxygen. Um, but it really doesn't look helpful if you wait until someone is sick enough to be on a mechanical um, ventilation mechanical ventilator. Um, And again, that's a timing issue. Most of those people are past the 10 days later stage. You've sort of missed your viral window. So more evidence that understanding the disease disease and phases is critical. Um, Effect of hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients with COVID-19 in the same New England Journal of Medicine. Um, So we finally get the data. We get to see the final um, HCQ data from the recovery trial. Um, And now they've looked at almost 5,000 patients. And just to sum it up, no benefit was seen. Actually, there was a trend toward a higher risk of death within 28 days in the HCQ group. So mortality was about 2% higher. Um, P-value didn't reach statistical significance, 0.15. And then they went through looking at all kinds of subgroups and consistent results seen in all pre-specified subgroups. Um, the results suggest that patients um, in the HCQ group were less likely to be discharged from the hospital alive within 28 days. Um, and among the patients who did undergo mechanical ventilation, um, those in the HCQ um, group had a higher frequency of either ending up on a vent or dying. So um, just just some really solid, large um, prospective data to say, please don't give our patients HCQ. All right, vaccines, and I'm actually going to talk about active and passive vaccines here. Um, you know, and so the J and J vaccine trial was paused, and most of us are saying this is a good thing. <laughs> and everyone says, well, "What are you talking about?" Um, and it just basically shows that things are being done properly, things are being done safely. Um, you know, this is the biggest of all the vaccine trials. Um, We still don't have any information on specifically what illness was detected in the one individual, Um, but the fact that it's not just pushing through or waiting to to find out what the story is there. Um, I think it's encouraging to know that this commitment to safety is there so that when the vaccines are released, um, we're going to have safe, effective vaccines. We're not going to have something, you know, rushed to market. Um, The second is the Eli Lilly um, trial that was, was paused. Um, And this, this I think, is interesting. There are several Eli Lilly trials being done, and these are the monoclonal antibody trials. So this is giving someone the antibodies. Um, And there is, again, a timing issue here. And in the animal study that was discussed in the most recent TWIV, you try to give these antibodies as early as possible. Um, In the human trials, which are being done, we try to give them within three days of a positive PCR. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually... 
Steve Catani and I were involved talking to Regeneron as early as April um, about let's not use these in hospitalized patients on ventilators. It makes no sense. Let's get these done in the outpatient setting. Here was a situation where they were still running a trial giving the monoclonal antibodies to hospitalized patients, you know, on ventilators, severe disease. Um, and that that was paused. And I think it, they sh- I think they should just pause it from a, a philosophical understanding of disease point. So, mm-hmm. um, so, Perhaps, not, so not now, an issue. So, what day of disease did the president receive his monoclonals? Do we know now? Doing the doing the clock, we think it was day six. Okay, so that's early enough, right? And he had just had some breathing difficulties, so still early enough to catch the viral phase, right? Yeah, it's early enough. And actually, uh, the Regeneron uh, data that was shared at the shareholders meeting, <laughs> yeah, one day it'll end up in a... If you basically look at people who have yet to mount their own antibody response, who are within yeah. 10 days, these are the people that do well. So he was, we think day six is what we're sort of getting a sense. So we think day six, we think prior to him making his own antibodies. So yeah, the timing was ideal. And the timing, um, we think if you can get it in in the right window, you're going to maybe 70, 80% of the time keep people from progressing. Mm -hmm. So those, I think that's optimistic and positive things. And then understanding the tale of COVID-19. Brain fog was getting a little bit more press recently. It was interesting. They actually were publicizing an article that had been published before. um, And this was an article, Post-Discharge Persistent Symptoms and health-related quality of life after hospitalization for COVID-19. This was published in the Journal of Infection. Um, And here they looked at over 100 patients, followed them out for 100 plus days. And uh, 34% were reporting um, loss of memory. 28% were reporting issues with concentration. Um, And interesting also, they looked at whether or not you were in the ICU or just general medical ward. No difference. It looks like this is really a COVID-19 complication. So I'm going to just finish there. I'm going to try to, I, I think we kept this like on target and, and within our 30 minute, what I try to go for. Um, but I want to just, before we do some emails, I want to thank everyone who's been going to Parasites Without Borders and helping support um, our micro TV fundraiser these two months. Um, that's been tremendous um, because we we do a lot. I, I try to do a lot to create content. Um, and Microbe TV has really been a wonderful platform for getting us this information out to everyone. So thank you to everyone supporting us. And thank you to Vincent mm, thank and you. the team. Thank you. And thank uh, all the donors. It's great. All right. We have a couple of emails. Uh, my friend Cliff, he's a college friend of mine who I've kept in touch with. He, he writes... A blurb today in my local paper suggests that according to CDC guidelines, persons with severe cases of COVID-19 ought to isolate for 20 days. Over the past few podcasts, Daniel Griffin suggests, as I recall, that SARS-CoV-2 positive patients are recommended to isolate for 10 days from the first positive test and hospitalized patients require two PCR negative tests before release. Would it be possible to ask him to clarify, like many people, I don't know what protocols are true or false? Okay, let me definitely clarify this because there are two there are two guidelines. Um, these are on the CDC website, and you know these have evolved over time. Um, people who have mild disease, so these are these are people who never end up in the hospital, never require oxygen, people who get better on their own. Um, there's good data based upon viral culture data, based upon CT values that correlate with levels of virus. Um, Ten days isolation for 10 days for mild outpatient. But there's a second group of patients. These are patients who have severe disease, patients who have um, issues with their immune system. That population, um, you can continue to isolate virus. You continue to culture virus. Um, You can continue to have elevated CT values and high viral RNA levels out to 19 days, which is why we have 20 for them. So there's two different rules, Um, 10 for your mild, 20 for your severe. Um, This is actually why the president's story was a little bit Hmm. um, of a mishmash, right? Because he had severe COVID. He ended up on oxygen. He ended up on steroids. He ended up in the hospital. Um, He would have been 20 days if you used just a timetable approach. But if you went ahead and looked at viral RNA levels, he was below that level as an individual. So those are the two rules, 10 days for mild, 20 days. And then remember the third, the quarantine. 
if you've been exposed, there's an incubation period. That's 14. So isolate for the infected, quarantine for the exposed. Okay. Christina writes, Dear Twiv and Dr. Griffin, I recently dealt with my family's first bout of cold symptoms in a pandemic. I wanted to share the experience to get the perspective of Dr. Griffin on two key questions. Should I have sent my kids to school and how does the common cold spread so easily? So uh, Christina's from a small town in northeastern Connecticut, low prevalence since March, 27 cases, population 4,200. Uh, public is public school is preschool through eighth grade, 400 students open full time, masks, partitions, distancing windows, fans, etc. She has two children who woke up on Sunday with congestion. Pediatrician did not recommend a COVID test after describing the symptoms. Daughter recalled that a classmate had been sick. That child had a fever, so the doctor recommended PCR. Her kids got better within 48 hours. Due to return to school, nurse said they don't need a negative COVID test, so she sent her kids to school. Husband stayed home with a tougher bout of the cold. My question is, should I have sent my kids to school without a negative COVID test? My daughter's classmate eventually tested negative. Results took four days to come back. Should I have had my kids tested and isolated as a family as we re awaited results that could have taken four days? So that's the first question. Yeah. So no, this is an excellent question, right? We're going to be seeing a lot of this. So hopefully I can give some guidance here. Um, you know, this is this is why I spend a lot of time trying to educate clinicians and why we do this this first part. Um, so it is it is tough um, to make a distinction here between you know COVID or not. Um, COVID tends not to present with a stuffy nose, which is interesting. Um, so, you know, what you're sort of describing here, I think that a pediatrician could potentially make a distinction and say, no, you know, when you lose your smell with COVID, it's not because you're congested. It's actually because um, there's actually a direct viral impact on um, the cells that are involved in, in smelling, um, basically the supporting cells. Um, so it's interesting. It, it doesn't, you know, say COVID doesn't make you sneeze. That's the one that's about the only thing it doesn't make you do. It tends not to give you a stuffy nose. So it sounds like the pediatrician here actually, you know, used judgment and said, I don't have a significance. Not every illness in the world is COVID. It wasn't presenting as a flu-like or viral syndrome. It was presenting like basically an upper, you know, congestive um, uh, process. And so I think this is reasonable, but it also points out, I think the issue wouldn't it have made everyone feel better if you had access to a you know rapid result, and then you could have just had that um, knowledge as well? And then she wants to know how is the common cold spreading so easily through the school when they're doing all these things? <laughs> you know, that is an excellent question, and I want to ask you that: How is that happening? And so I want you to think about this. You know, we we you know. One is we don't think there's a lot of spread going on within the walls of the school, um, but there are your kids having play dates with other friends. Are they basically going back to sort of the other, you know, extracurricular social interactions? Because we are, we're seeing colds. I, I have a patient I'm taking care of um, who is a long hauler, right? She works at one of the retail stores in New York City. She had a very similar presentation when she developed nasal congestion and a coworker. And I'm just like, if we're being so careful, how did, and she got it in the workplace. How did you get the common cold in the workplace when we're doing all this stuff to protect against COVID? So obviously, you know, the hand washing, all the other stuff, um, yeah. We, we got to do it. You got to keep doing all these things. Well, also the common cold caused by other viruses, there's, there's a big component of spread by fomites, hand to mouth contamination, hand to nose, right? So kids are yeah. really good at doing that, especially outside the school. So that's uh, another part of it. Oh, they are. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Watch, watch, watch a child and cringe. <laughs> uh, Gene writes, did the first patient that Dr. Griffin described on October 8th suffer from a spontaneous retroperitoneal bleed? central access that was attempted or present that resulted in the bleed in the context of anticoagulant, spontaneous common femoral artery or vein bleeding as the culprit or something else. I hope you understood uh, that because I don't. Yeah, the, <laughs> yeah. so this is a good, the doctors will, I'll get this and I'll explain it to everyone else. <laughs> so um, this is an individual who um, was put, who had COVID, got admitted, got, you know, standard treatments, including being put on um 
anticoagulation because we know that, you know, probably about one in five, one in, you know, four, something like that, uh, depending on the study you're looking at, um, can actually develop major clotting complications if you don't do that. Um, the bleeding here was not retroperitoneal. So retroperitoneal is sort of behind the peritoneum, um, back where the kidneys are. Um, this bleeding was actually into the thigh. Um, so it was a, it was a spontaneous um, bleed into the thigh. Um, was it coming from the artery or the vein? Um, considering that she dropped her, um, her blood volume this quickly, right? She dropped, basically her hematocrit went from 42 to 21, um, you know, in a matter of hours. Um, that would actually argue that it was as an arterial bleed to be, and, you know, and how tense the leg got was under quite a bit of pressure. Um, so that's what we think happened here. Um, you know, the, the general recommendation across the board by the American Thoracic Society, by the American Society of Hematology, or ASH, is to put patients on um, a prophylactic uh, dose of something called low molecular weight heparin. Um, and the acknowledgement is, is there is a certain bleeding risk, as we saw here. Um, but without that intervention, there's a significant clotting, clotting risk. All right, one more from Alan Cohen. I'm a volunteer retired ID physician working with a local university as part of a COVID-19 response team. We want to do frequent testing of competitive sports teams and students with higher exposure risks. We're looking at Abbott, ID Now, Kedel Systems, and Binax Now. We're trying to see which system ProHealth New York is using for rapid testing. And also, if a concern of a false positive arises, do you repeat the same test or switch to a molecular test? So um, <clears throat> we use actually a lot of different modalities for each different school. And actually, it's been nice now that we have the calculator, we're already using that to walk institutions through the different approaches. Um, you always need a confirmatory um, test uh, because it just it doesn't fly to tell people, you know, considering the majority of positives are false positives that are mm -hmm. indeterminants, as we like to say, that they just need to stay out of school that day and we'll test you again tomorrow. So we're usually using the Abbott ID now as our confirmatory um, testing, um, just because you know within eight to twelve minutes we're getting we're getting a result there. Um, so we're using a lot of different modalities up front. If it's going to be a once a week um, testing, then we're going to be using the PCR. If we can work out a system where it's more frequent, either daily or biweekly, um, then we'll consider using um, the. Uh, it's actually, we're using the um, BD antigen system. The Veritor is what we're using. Um, so yeah, if you're going to use the antigen test, um, you want to do it more often than once a week. Um, you know, if you do it every day, that's fantastic. If you do it biweekly, that's also reasonable. And you can sort of look at your budget using the calculator. Um, but yeah, we usually are using the Abbott ID now as the confirmatory test. So if you use some other test and it's a positive, you use Abbott ID now to confirm it, right? That's what you're we saying. do, but interesting. I'll tell you, if you went to it, if you went to one of our urgent cares, and we only, let's say, we only had supplies for Abbott ID now, and yeah. this happens, right? Um, you know, if the first test came up positive, um, we would run a second Abbott ID now um, because the positive test, it's not the person that makes the test positive; it's the technology, um, and so it's not as though the second test. So if you run a second test, you know, 15 minutes later. And, you know, the first, the first one was positive and the next one is negative. It's not like suddenly your level of RNA is going to drop and mm -hmm. you're getting yeah. a negative. Yeah. So now if you uh, do the second test, is it a new sample or is it the same sample? New sample, new sample. And actually, you know, it'd be nice someday to do like a little video so people could see how this is done. But, um, you know, so you, you put the Q-tip in, you know, you roll it around, you know, like to do 15 seconds minimum each side. Um, you've already kind of got the machine set up. And now that Q-tip is then going to go into a little area in the machine and you sort of move it around a little, sort of the special swirling you do, not too vigorous, but vigorous enough. And then there's moving some stuff around, pushing some buttons. So each time you run it, you really want to have like a, a fresh swab that goes straight in. They've done some studies, and I think this can get you into trouble, where they do the swabs and then they put them in like a, a little envelope and then they put them on dry ice. That You're losing sensitivity when you do that. So um, our our process has always been to basically do a fresh wet swab straight into it. You've got that sensitivity down to like 6,000 or less RNA copy number. 
All right. That's our weekly COVID-19 report from Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Pleasure as always. Take care and everyone be safe. Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommier. From rainy Fort Lee, New Jersey, something like 50 degrees out, mist. I can barely see the bridge, the second uh, tower of the bridge from my windows. It's a great day for taking a nap, <laughs> which we're not going to do, of course, but it's a great day for taking a nap. Yeah, it's a very, very miserable day here in the Northeast. Yeah, we deserve the weather, though. We're kind of a droughty fall. I think. I don't know. Yeah. We had enough yeah. rain. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's, um, let's see, winds out of the north at about three knots, visibility two miles in uh, hard rain and mist. And uh, ceilings about 3,400 at uh, Westover Air Force Base. From Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 72 degrees in Austin, Texas, and brilliant (laughs) sunshine. Uh, Headed for 74. Oh, wow. Uh, And I'm looking at, you know, you need the long-range forecast. I see one (laughs) touch of 90 degrees on Sunday, and everything else is in the 80s and even down in the 70s. I'll be darned. This is good. (laughs) And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. Um, it's 54 and very rainy, and I agree with Dixon. It's a good day to take a nap or maybe have some soup. <laughs> it's always amusing to me when I get letters. Uh, I got one the other day where the guy said, great podcast, but the weather, surely that's a waste of time. <laughs> and I just think, well, you just don't get it. You know, no. what's, a, what's a waste of time to you may be golden for others, right? That's the way it's the an world is. part of the atmosphere. Yeah. Truly. <laughs> Many people like it. And if, if uh, you notice when people write in letters, often they tell us the weather in their locale. Yes. So right. you're stuck with it. I'm sorry. You have, what, what is the, uh, is there a saying where to get the good stuff, you have to have the chaff with the weed or how does that go? Right. Something like that. Something yeah. like that. But this is not chaff. This is, um, this is um, a colorful background info as to where that person is. Hey, listen, would you guys get on with it? Let's do some <laughs> science, okay? You know, uh, we could have stumbled on you know, any. My neighbors down the street, they, they had a tree fall and they had, and they had that removed. So you know what that means. Stump grinding, stump grinding. <laughs> they had to come in with a stump grinder. And, you know, we could we could have started for, for off. People who just joined during the pandemic, by the way, we have a, a one of our many running arcs is about stump grinders. Stump grinders. <laughs> we could have somehow started off talking about, hey, what'd you have for, for lunch? What'd you have for dinner? And done that for 12 years, but we didn't. That's so right. No, no, we you know, did not. That, that might not be so interesting. I don't care what that you had sardines well, for is, lunch. I'm, the fact is I'm interested in what the weather is. Is where you are. Yeah, I mean, we're not yeah. interested. We, we were actually talking about lunch before we we started recording, and uh, you know, Rich, that's a standard sound check Rich, right that's right. That's yeah, right. yeah that's what you have exactly. for breakfast, Rich? Uh, you know, he said, "Oh, I have no problem eating." And I know that whenever we do a live show in the old days, you know, I'd be running around stressed and nervous. I couldn't eat. And he's sitting there on the on the dais with this huge <laughs> sandwich, chowing down like nothing happens. You know, amazing. Well, you didn't give him a job. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, tw- Twiv 186, from Buda to stump grinding. Yes. Yeah. We had a listener write in. As I recall, we had a listener write in and complain about the banter. And yes. So we, we bantered. really showered him with banter. <laughs> I think that listener probably left. Yes. Most likely. Uh, th- a few a few PSAs, as they say, uh, throughout the months of October and November, all donations to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled and donated to Microbe TV. And exactly. Paras- Very nice. Thank you, Daniel, and Parasites Without Borders. Parasiteswithoutborders.com. La- there's a laboratory technician position available with Amy Rosenfeld to work on plus strand RNA viruses that lead to respiratory and neurological diseases. Applicants should have a BS in science, some lab experience that is not a laboratory class. Email tech at microbe.tv. Amy emailed me a tweet from after her episode. Amy, you are grumpy in a good way, (laughs) (laughs) which means I am grumpy in a bad way. Sorry. 
It's me. You got it. If you don't want me, there's no show. Okay. <laughs> well, they even enjoyed her sense of humor, as it uh, as I read on. Yeah, yeah she, she, we she had did a good lot job. Of fun. She did a good job. The biological safety program at Columbia has an opening for a biological safety officer. In the age of COVID nineteen, biological safety professionals have never been more needed, valued, or felt more purpose in their calling. The ideal candidate would be someone with a life sciences degree, bachelor's or higher, and at least two years of laboratory experience who's hungry to learn about infectious agents and molecular biology. More information and application instructions are available on the Careers at Columbia website. We'll put a link to that in the show notes. I work a lot with biological safety officers. It's very important because yeah. you have to make sure you and do everything you should, properly. If you're interested in either of those jobs, you probably ought to apply for both of them. Yeah, we, actually, we actually had, you know, people, these are what, um, we used to call them narcs, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there were, the, there were the, the radiation safety officers, those yes. were the nuke narcs, okay? The, the biological safety officers were the bug narcs, okay? And, uh, <laughs> but the fact is that they do an important job. Yes. Okay. Yes. And, right. and 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 right. we had a. I think it's important not to have, if uh, if possible. Hopefully, there can uh, you can have a, uh, you know, a productive relationship uh, with these people in Absolutely. in a university. And uh, my relationship with all these people was always the 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 narcs at uh, University of Florida were actually uh, quite good, and they helped us out a lot. Uh, and where there was a problem, we would work out the problem and we That's would right. come to some That's sort right. of satisfactory solution. And I think uh, it made us all safer in the long it run. Did. That's good. I used to always enjoy the interview I got when I reapplied for my grant and it was funded. And then they would invite me in and ask me what the risks were of handling trichinella spiralis in mice in the animal room. And I said, as long as you're not into eating raw mice, you're okay. <laughs> I said, one of you looks a little cat-like, so I'm a little worried, but otherwise everybody's fine. <laughs> A little cat like, a little cat like. That's right. Yeah. So actually, if you're if you're not you know sort of allergic to uh, regulation, being a biological safety officer could be uh, an interesting gig, you know, because you get to know all the labs in the university and all the yeah. people. It's it's a lot true. of problem solving. That's yeah, right. I always had uh, really useful conversations with a lot of our safety officers in terms of best practices and how to do my experiments well. Um, I felt like they were always really useful um, resources. Yeah, I had in grad school, I had actually really good, helpful conversations with when I was doing a series of experiments that required orthophosphate, which is this ridiculously hot prep of, of phosphorus. That, same and same. Yeah, yeah. So, I was, uh, uh, yeah, I guess I need to talk to radiation safety. They were, oh, yeah, yeah, you should shield this, this, and here's something to be concerned about. And and the nice thing about orthophosphate is that it's got a two-week half-life, so it's not like it's going to be around forever that hot, but um, you... Yeah, actually, you remind me, we went through uh, a period of time, uh, UF now, long ago, those sort of, you know, 50 millicuries at a pop was uh, fairly standard. Yes. But that, you know, uh, more recently, that wasn't the case. But uh, so the the narcs weren't necessarily used to doing that too, routinely, I don't think. But uh, we ran into a situation where we needed, uh, we needed to do a couple of experiments on that scale. And they actually came in and we told them, you know, how are we going to deal with this? And we worked out a protocol with them that a matter of fact had to do with picking up the waste on the day of the experiment and getting it out of the laboratory. That was part of the deal. Okay. okay. That's a, that's so a it was idea. great. That's I had, good. I had a separate pail for mine that was behind like six <clears throat> inches of plexiglass that, yeah. <laughs> I, I did my thesis so long ago that no one cared what we did. No one cared. I didn't even know there was a radiation safety office. The 50 millicuries. Did you give of, yourself the shakes from mouth pipetting acrylamide too? Oh, no, I, did I have the shakes? Or are we not supposed to tell that story? Uh, it's fine. You could tell <laughs> anything. No problem. I, I, maybe that may be well. I did a lot of mouth Doris pipetting. Doris told that yeah. story. So yeah. well, I, I believe it. I did uh, a lot of mouth pipetting. We used a lot of orthophosphate and uh, I never saw any kind of safety officer. So. Things have gotten better. Yeah, they've changed. It's and, fine. And yeah, and this is this is the kind of job that um, you know somebody could turn into various sorts of careers. You'd get to know all yeah. the PIs. You'd get to know a whole bunch of people. Uh, you'd get to know the regulations. I mean, interfacing with all that is just useful stuff. So I just let's put it this way: 
my technique happens to be impeccable, but not everyone else's is. <laughs> yes. Therefore, we need biological safety officers to make sure they're taken care of. Right, right. <laughs> right. Yes. There you go. Um, we had a lot of people write in and say, what is this Great Barrington Declaration? Can you address this? Many, many people. And, you know, having spent a number of uh, – uh, days in Great Barrington, the western part of Mass really the western part of Massachusetts. Yeah. Uh, I said, oh, it's a lovely place, but this is but not beautiful. a lovely. This is not it's a lovely Tanglewood, document. Yeah, Tanglewood, Tanglewood is there. there. There's great hiking. There, yes, very um, nice. Couple of it, even yeah, good fishing. It, yeah, there's good. Fishing. There's good lake fishing. Um, there's some and, good, uh, good streams up there. A couple. Okay. Of them. Okay, I haven't tried this. So this document, yeah. this website document, is actually an insult to the niceness of Great Barrington. Is because it, uh, the, the town of Great Barrington should lodge a protest, I think, for having their name associated with it. I think this they stuff. actually have come out and uh, denied against it. Yeah, I, good. Yeah. So this is uh, a, a document which says, okay, we know that it's mostly old people who are at risk. So let's keep them. So who cares? Let's keep them. <laughs> Let's not disrupt our society for this little virus. Exactly. Let's keep the old people under quarantine. Let everybody else go back to their lives, and that'll be fine. And this is signed uh -huh. by, which is, of course, is nonsense, because it's not just old people who are at risk. If we did That's a calculation right. for how many 20 to 30-year-olds there are in the U.S. and how many of those get sick, eh, there'd be a exactly. lot of sick people and deaths as well. So this is a ridiculous but assumption. And the idea that you can actually keep older people away, it's not just older people in nursing homes, folks. It's older people like me and Dixon who are, you know, in the world teaching and so forth. This is just nonsense. And the, what's killing me is it's signed by people with degrees of various sorts and university affiliations, although I didn't see a single virologist there. Um, I didn't recognize any names. I, I haven't looked at it recently, but I I'd love to know what the age they, group they was do have. The they do have relevant degrees and and faculty positions or affiliations with various <laughs> universities, so it has this air of credibility about it. But there are so many levels on which this is just wrong. Correct. I mean, I mean, as Vincent said, That's it's right. not That's right. the the whole notion that oh, young people are not harmed by this is wrong. Their yes. yeah, their their death rate is lower, but it's not nothing. Um, right. You really don't want to get this virus, and and there's after effects also. And there are I mean, after if you don't effects, die. and there, are, I mean, there sure. are kids that have died of this, so nobody exactly. is safe. Exactly. Um, there's also uh, a lot of people haven't really gotten their heads around this notion, but as we've learned more about this virus, it's becoming clearer and clearer that the whole idea of accomplishing herd immunity against this particular virus may be off the table. That's right. Because we now know, we now have good, reliable case reports from people who've had multiple infections with SARS-CoV-2, where they got the virus, they got over it, they cleared the infection, they had antibodies against the virus, they got infected again. And we know this because in order to know this for sure, you have to sequence the whole genome of the, both viruses. We know they got it again, separate infection, and, you know, it grew in them and they were capable they were contagious they were capable of spreading it so given that that's the case just within the six month time frame that this can happen with this pandemic um we know that immunity is not sterilizing and durable for everybody it might not be sterilizing and durable for anybody right so the the whole underlying concept between this behind this herd immunity approach is just proven wrong. Right. And, and I, will, I will just point out that Alan is talking about sort of naturally acquired herd immunity, yes. um, not necessarily immunity that comes from a vaccine. Um, right. And so we, it is possible that a vaccine could induce that type of immunity. We and that's know. why keeping measures in place uh, until we have a vaccine is important. It's not as if we're throwing out the vaccine too here. No, 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 no. So it's it's possible with a vaccine, since the trials are ongoing now and we won't really have results until toward the end of the year, um, the, the vaccine could have this same problem. I've, we've got like nine of them in clinical trials already. So it seems something's going to get us to good immunity. Um, but even if 
we have a vaccine, even if all of our vaccines have the same problem, that they don't provide complete perfect immunity, that you could still get infected with the virus, if they're protective against disease and they don't have, you know, bad side effects right. like the virus right. does, then the vaccine's going to be a huge step up. What we'd like is a vaccine that gives sterilizing immunity, and we really hope oh, we well. get that. Um, but in terms of sending people out to get infected with the virus in, and getting... It's insane. It's not going to work. I mean, just on a fundamental level, before we even get to the ethics of it, it will not work. I have to just say that we are having a spike globally in infections yes. now. Mm -hmm. And it is yes. in part due to the fact that people have gone back to school. And listen to what yes. they say here. Schools and universities should be open for in-person teaching. Extracurricular oh. activities such as sports should be resumed. This is ridiculous. It's insane. How Correct. many teams have had outbreaks amongst them? And the coaches are now youngsters. So yep. this, this whole thing is crazy. The idea that you can segregate. Oneonta, Oneonta, right? Yeah, Please. just this past week in MMWR, there was a um, report of a super spreader event from a youth hockey game. Yes. Yeah. Well, 700 students at uh, the State University of New York at Oneonta were positive. The president under pressure because they did nothing. She did nothing. She resigned. So now they're looking for a new president to to set the law down and to to reestablish safe principles. But this whole that idea was not being practiced. This whole yeah. idea that you can keep the at risk people segregated is just ridiculous because they work too. I they agree. have jobs, right? Yeah. And so, if you, it, it doesn't make any sense. And well, I don't and know. There's also, there's also the issue that if <laughs> if the young people are out there spreading the virus. Are, are we assuming that young people never have any contact with older people? That, that's exactly what these people right, are thinking. Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's, right. that's exactly right. We're all right. connected. And right. I, I can't imagine a way that you would ever completely block off connections between different groups. That doesn't make any where, sense. Where is your so nursing right. staff so at the right. nursing home coming from? Where is that's your, right. I mean, that's just, right. It's how exactly do you, right. Yeah. who are your grocery clerks? No thought. Out to buy, just, no thought so at the head all. Coach, the head coach for the University of Alabama, Lou Saban, tested positive for the coronavirus. And he came on TV, A, without a mask, to explain how he was so amazed that he caught it because he didn't do anything wrong. He always wore a mask. He always safe distanced. And he never hung out in crowds. And then they cut away for a commercial, and it's an Aflac commercial. And there is Lou Saban without a mask in front of a whole bunch of people talking about what Aflac will do for you in terms of your, your <laughs> insurance. And of course he was around TV producers and assistants that he was getting makeup on and everything else, of course, without a mask. So, you, hey, Lou, you wonder where you caught it. Take a look at your own ad. So I want to point out that this <clears throat> website with the declaration, the declaration itself is very brief. It has absolutely no documentation whatsoever. That's crazy. It puts out this thing in broad so strokes, even though there are you know, uh, uh, people from, you know, high end institutions with uh, uh, what a, what look like appropriate uh, credentials on it. Uh, and there's no, no documentation, no papers, and they don't, uh, they don't address any of these issues that we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, so it's very uh, sad. It's and, very crazy. And as a journalist, I see something like this that's just completely <clears throat> way off base. And I have to ask, who's bankrolling it? Uh, and as soon as you ask that question, uh, you get a really interesting answer here uh, because they even admit their funding source, which is very nice of them. Um, you could you could photo search their locations and some of their pictures and get it as well. Um, they are backed by the American Institute for Economic Research, which is a libertarian think tank whose revenues come primarily from oil company investments and that's strongly linked to the Koch brothers. And if you there know you anything about that outfit, there you know you that their main mission is to further enrich billionaires um, at the expense of everybody else. And that's what's going on here. This I love is. it. They're, they're, the wiki site says their holdings include a wide range of fossil fuel companies along with tobacco giant Philip Morris. Yes. Yum. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Merchants of Death, that's uh, that's pretty much who you're dealing with. I just here. want to say to all the professors um, and clinicians who have signed this, you should be ashamed of yourself for yes. supporting yeah. this because there's no scientific basis for any of this. And what are you thinking? What are you thinking? 
Right. Unfortunately, I, it validates uh, 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 certain elements of our society who think it's a good idea not to do anything. Yeah. Okay. Well, read and the Swedish and, reports and you'll find out that's not true either. And, yeah. uh, and that's too bad. <laughs> well, yeah. so I think there's one other piece about sort of separating the populations that people sometimes forget. Um, as an immunologist, as an immunology professor, I don't know if this makes me unique, um, but everyone likes to tell me about their immune system. Um, really? <laughs> yes. Really? And, and so there Brianna, are, I think there are, or something. No, that's not right. <laughs> but, but I, a fair number of people who I know have told me about medical conditions that make them immunosuppressed or mm. medications that are, that they are on, um, that are immunosuppressive. Um, and many of those people are people who you might see in your daily life and not think of as a vulnerable person. Um, yet because of whatever those things that they felt to, they wanted to disclose to me um, are, I know that they that those people are. Um, are we asking them to stay home and sort of disclose this to everyone else? Are we saying that they aren't valuable and they should go back to work? Uh, there's a, there's um, a, it's, there, it's, there are a lot of people here that we're not thinking about when we think about yeah. who is vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at the, the risk profile for COVID-19, uh, it's not just age. Age is the really easy to identify thing. Yes, if you're if you're over sixty, I mean, heck, if you're over fifty, you're getting into the yeah, the risk goes way up. But if you look at what are the conditions that increase your risk of developing serious COVID nineteen, you go down that list, it it ends up describing over half of Americans. Right. You know, it's like high blood pressure and type two diabetes, that's right. sclerosis and obesity. And you got and it. You, you, got you go it. through you this list. It. You're like, that's right. That's right. How many people don't qualify in some way? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. right. You, and, mean they and have you may have one of those and not even realize that a lot of people <laughs> have poorly managed hypertension and, and just. Yeah. Uh, I will, I will say that uh, uh, my wife and I have become regular watchers of the PBS news hour recently. Oh, yeah. And uh, they had on either last night or the night before, uh, Angela Rasmussen, Vincent from Columbia, uh, virologist from Columbia, who's uh, one of their go to people about things uh, virological. And she did a very nice job of uh, trashing this document. So at oh, least good. in some arms of the media, uh, it's getting appropriate pushback. Yeah, but you know as well as I do, Rich, that people watch what they uh, agree that's with. That's right. And that's, that's uh, right. to set up your filter bubble. Yep. Yeah. No, it's, it's quite possible. Yeah. Oh, well. All right. Duh. Let's move on to some brevia. A couple of interesting yes. reports here. First one is a paper published in Nature Communications. Smell and taste changes are early indicators of the COVID-19 pandemic and political decision effectiveness. And this is a study mainly uh, out of France, but a number of other institutions all over the world as you know, well. I have to say, for, when I saw the title of this, I thought, well, you know, for years, I've made political judgments based on the on the basis of what smells funny. The smell test? <laughs> you know, like, does this pass a sniff test? <laughs> yeah, that's um, but yeah, this is, this is a, a really good way to approach SARS-CoV-2 because yeah that the title struck me in the, exactly the same way <laughs> exactly. so the exactly. idea here is you know uh, well they they take this from the French perspective where there was a lockdown uh, beginning in March and then they say how do we relax the knockdown what do we do and they made areas that are red or green depending on the prevalence of infection and um, you know they re the French uh, Ministry of Health used the ratio of consultations for suspected COVID-19 to general consultations in the ER and hospitals as an indicator to assess the circulation uh, of the virus. Um, but they noticed that they note that, you know, changes in smell and taste are very prominent and early symptoms uh, of the disease that, that have been seen in many countries. And uh, they're actually more specific than things like fever or dry cough, right? Uh, not many infections cause uh, a loss of uh, smell and taste. So they say, could this be a good indicator before the actual outbreak of what's going on? So they use data from a, a, a global crowdsourced study in 30 languages 
to test whether changes in smell or taste at the population level can be used as an early indicator uh, for outbreaks. And they basically take these data and they apply statistical procedures uh, and they basically find in the pictures, you know, this is an open access journal, are very, very uh, instructive that uh, smell and, and taste are quite early uh, symptoms of uh, the, the emergence of uh, infections simply by tracking smell and taste in a population. They went over this on a country by country basis. Um, they looked at it with sex and age, and it seems to be consistent across uh, all of them. So if you track- and It's important to note that this is not a reliable enough diagnostic indicator at the individual level. Mm -hmm. Not everybody loses their sense of smell and taste That's right. when they get SARS-CoV-2. That's correct. But it is a common enough symptom that if we want to track a population, it's going to show up and they're going to be enough. It'll be proportional to the number of cases. And in fact, just figure one in the paper shows that if you look at people's first symptoms versus when they lost smell and taste and you track that in the population, uh, the, the loss of smell and taste is just this really nice indicator that pops up about a week before your test results come back. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's, a, that's a very important point. This is for popular. It's kind of like Google flu, right? Where people, right. you look at searches for flu medications, you can get an idea in the population of what's going on. Which didn't actually work all that well, but this is a better, <laughs> a better way to. <laughs> True. So Vincent, uh, if you uh, lost your sense of taste and smell, would you go to your doctor and demand uh, remdesivir or some in, in a Not a based on the new data from the WHO study. <laughs> well, that, <laughs> this is all true. But the antibody studies, there's, it's out still. So would you uh, require a compassionate treatment if, if you suspected that you had that without any symptoms? Would I go to my doctor and this. demand? No, I... I don't really go to doctors and demand anything. I would actually email <laughs> Daniel Griffin and say, hey, Daniel, yeah, I got- well, he's a doctor. He's a what, doctor. Uh, what should I do? And he would tell me. He'd say, come out here, Vincent, and we'll give you some uh, monoclonals or whatever. Right. I would do right, that right. because I, I do have a, a physician, right, who I like yep. and trust, yep. but yep. he's not an infectious disease. He's just a general practitioner, which is fine. Uh, but I, I know I have a connection with Jan Daniel, so that's what I would do. Sure. But anyone sure. else, yeah, if you lose your sense of smell, you call, you do telemedicine, you call your physician and say, what should that's I right. do? And not everyone's going to get remdesivir and monoclonal antibodies. So monoclonals are not even on an EUA yet, right? So That's right. That's exactly uh, you can't right. get that. One of the and things and I like about this- Remdesivir may not be all that helpful is the- the latest data we've got. So. Well, the, the problem with that is that it's all used late uh, in illness, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's, people are already past the viral phase. If you if you gave that drug early, it would probably make a difference. But it might have a bigger effect. Yeah, that's not how it's done. One of the things I like best about this paper is that, as Vincent mentioned, the primary data collection is crowdsourced. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Through uh, this. Through this sure. site, you go down to the methods <clears throat> and you can click on a link to the site that crowdsources the data. It's called the Global Consortium for Chemo Sensory, uh, Sensory Research. Oh. Uh, and they say that uh, you, know, you can participate. You can take two studies, a survey, uh, and I love this. I haven't gone through it, but a self-check with items that you can find in your home. So my guess is they go around and they say, uh, can you smell this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <Some> garlic. <laughs> <laughs> the fridge. Yeah. That's right. That's and right. You fill out a you fill out a form. Uh, they have a little section here called "How We Started." They say in response to anecdotal reports of loss of sense of smell and taste in people who have tested positive for COVID nineteen, a group of international smell and taste researchers have united to study how, when, and why this is happening and what it can tell us about coronavirus. So right. you you know. So you fill out a form to participate in this, I, and and looking through the methods, they uh, did some, you know, some filtering on the data to yeah. make sure they had a robust uh, data set. But I think it's delightful. I think it's just great. Yeah, it's an yeah. example does, does of loss a, of smell and taste. I sorry, I don't recall the data. Does it last through the viremia, or does it last longer than viremia, or does it last up until the time antibodies appear? Mm -hmm. What's yes. the hallmark for this, or does it last forever? <laughs> yes, it can do any of those things. It can be yeah, transient, or it can go on for quite a yeah. long time. Yeah, right. But I, I think this is a nice example of how you can take 
uh, easily obtainable data and make a conclusion. Now they do say we, we think we should do large scale validation studies for, to assess, you know, this association, but uh, it could be a useful way f to, f to monitor the effectiveness of a lockdown, for example, yeah. to see when something's coming back and so forth. So I, I really like this study. Yeah, and that's, that's the political uh, political response um, aspect of it is that they graph when countries implemented their lockdowns and to what degree and when you see the peak in loss of smell and when you see the peak in first symptoms and when you see the peak in actual test results. Right. And one of the problems was immediately after the lockdown, nothing improved. People were still, you know, yeah, the, yeah. Test, the positive test rate was still going up, up, up. And so we've shut down our whole economy and we're still getting more and more positive tests. Is it working? And of course, here on TWIV, we were saying, hold on, it's a lagging indicator. You got to wait a couple of weeks before the test results will come down. Um, what you see here is, yeah, that was the case, you know. Uh, but if you had tracked loss of sense of smell, it peaked almost immediately after the lockdowns and started coming just plummeting. Right. right? Well, so the, the incidence of new cases is going down. And you could use it in the opposite way as well yes. as an earlier way to say, oh, things are starting to get bad again. Um, we need to act earlier. Yes. And so if you're waiting for what they talk about here as, you know, the government indicator, um, you wouldn't make a response until a week later than you would if yeah. you were ma monitoring smell and taste change. In fact, that shows up really well in the in the UK graph mm -hmm. where they show the smell and taste change goes up, lockdown, it comes down and then things are relaxed a little bit, it comes back up again, and then it comes back down again, and it's trending downward now, um, whereas test results are a lot less reliable at indicating this. Yes. Has anyone here ever lost their sense of smell and or taste? Sure. No. no. I don't know what I, that's like. I have. Basically, Maybe. every time I get a sinus infection, really? I kind of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I've been a little congested. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not it's not gone. It's no. just like it's annoying. oh, this food tastes kind of bland. <laughs> if I shove it right up next to my nose, oh wow, well, yeah, that's, yeah. that's so I uh, only yeah. had it once when I was a freshman in college. I went to Cornell. And the first weeks I got a respiratory infection. It was just annoying, but I completely lost my sense of taste. Smell. And that's I right. couldn't eat because the food had no taste. It was just bulk. And it yeah, freaked me out. Yeah, I'd yeah. never had anything like it. And exactly. You can imagine this is how much taste contributes to your yeah. eating, right? <laughs> oh, absolutely. And enjoyment. actually, actually yeah, Vincent, that, that you, I've never experienced. Vincent, if you were in a college cafeteria, it may have been doing you a favor. <laughs> That's right. I was. You may not have lost your sense of I was. Yes, smell. My, my first, uh, <laughs> yeah, my first year I was on the meal plan. I remember that. And I just remember sitting in there saying, oh, my God, what is this? And now thinking back, I wonder what it was. Um, some, so, because, you know, influenza typically doesn't do that. I don't know. But must have been an, uh, maybe it was a common cold coronavirus. Maybe it was yeah, a coronavirus. Yeah, no, no, I think that's, 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 that's absolutely right. And then absolutely. it took a few weeks. and uh, But I just yes. did not look forward to eating because of it. Mm. You know, I think exactly, exactly. All right. I can't imagine not looking forward to eating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got it. Are, are we going back to the pre-show conversation? Apparently, <laughs> apparently. Rich likes to eat, right? I do too. Come on. I love to eat. Rich doesn't show it. I do. <laughs> All right. We have another interesting paper from Cell. Someone I know used to call this journal Smell. Do you ever you remember that? Smell. Yeah, I've heard that before, yeah. It's, it's kind of derogatory. Uh, vascular disease and thrombosis in SARS-CoV-2 infected rhesus macaques from a very large group at uh, Brianne's old stomping grounds, yes. Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And um, how, how many, uh, the correspondence is Dan Baruch, mm -hmm. uh, who's at the end there. Did you know Dan? Did you ever meet him? I... Uh know Dan quite well. Um, and for a while he was working in a bay next to mine. So yes, He's, I he very was, much uh, know Dan Baruch. He was on TWIV many years ago. I think uh, with Alan, you came over to Boston and we yes. did a TWIV with him and one other person who I, I can't remember at was the time. That, was that at ASM or was that? No, no it, that was in, was a, it was in Boston at Harvard. Uh, yeah, that's right. That was right. It was, it was in a lecture hall. 
Uh, we just do Google Baruch Twiv 244, Dan Baruch and Jeff Teigler. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, actually, I, by the way, for listeners, I have found when I want to know what Twiv did what, if I just Google Twiv and some yeah. keyword, a lot of stuff pops up. It yeah. works pretty well. It does. Anyway, it, I, I went, I was invited by Dan to give a seminar because they had found that in SIV, simian immunodeficiency infected macaques, they have a huge expansion of their uh, gut virome, in particular, uh, enteroviruses explode. And he wanted to know why. And, you know, we, we were going to collaborate, but it never worked out. And then we did a TWIV, and, and Alan, I think you drove out or something. And yeah, yeah. We did that. Anyway, that's Dan Baruch. And uh, he, is, he is, like many people, uh, I switched over to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I was talking to Amy this morning. I said, is it possible that every virologist in the world is now going to work on SARS-CoV-2? Is and <laughs> is NIH in the no. U.S. going to shift all its... Can't be. There are other viruses out there. Come on. Some people don't have a BSL-3. That's yeah. <laughs> That might be part yeah, of the don't problem. Don't worry. It, it'll... Other fields will come back. So, Vincent, didn't we have a guest on our show that suggested that the virus is also reproducing in endothelial cells? So that uh, the that's why I picked this paper. Yes, that's why I picked this paper. The guy, um, th the two surgeons whose names I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, exactly right. At MIT. He said this and is a pneumonia like no other because there's endothelial cell damage. And he says it's by virus rep reproduction. And I thought, mm, I don't think so. I, yeah, yeah, you know what? I didn't say a word either, but I, I actually picked up on that pretty fast. because uh, uh, Yeah, so I picked this paper to – because this paper shows that basically it's an, infl it's an inflammatory damage basically to the endothelium. Right. And there's no right, – as far right. as I can tell, there's no evidence for virus. And there's no ACE2 receptor on the cell anyway, right? I don't know Is the answer, true? but I don't think there's any good evidence that there's virus reproduction in endothelial cells in the alveoli, which is what the surgeon said. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But that's, uh, that's what caught my eye about this. And this paper compares actually human specimens with macaques, experimentally sure. infected macaques, sure, sure. and they do histopathology and they yep. do uh, RNA transcriptomics. And they say, what's going on? And basically, they find that this is, you know, this is a prothrombotic clotting factor infl exactly. inflammatory in induction that's going on down there. It's not, yeah, yeah. they don't mention virus infection of endothelial cells once uh, in oh, this paper. Right. So I like it. It's very, it's very carefully done. Good deal. And, you know, so we all know from what Daniel has told us that some aspects of SARS -CoV of COVID-19, right, after the viral phase, you get into this clotting phase where- yes. People have all kinds of clots, and, and they say here, you know, elevated D-dimer, which is a fibrin degradation product in, in, in patients, extensive microvascular thromboses, Daniel has talked about too. And they say yep. this is these things are not typically observed in other respiratory virus infection, right. uh, markers of endothelial platelet activation. So this paper, they study human and, and rhesus macaque specimens. They take some uh, autopsy samples. They have autopsies of COVID-19 patients from April at Beth Israel. And um, they observe vascular thromboses, clots, right? Endotheliitis and inflammation in the lung, which has been seen by others. And then they infect uh, the rhesus macaques and allow the virus to reproduce in them. And they can do even more a careful histopathology, and they basically see similar signs of endotheliitis, inflammation, clotting, and so forth, microvascular clotting in the lungs mm. uh, of mm. the macaques. And the, the macaques, from what I understand, are um, a pretty good model of what we would call in humans mild to moderate COVID-19. That's correct. They, yeah. they don't correct. die. They don't die. Um, so this is the disease in somebody who gets it, feels sick, gets a cough, and then gets better. Um, now, of necessity, in order to do the histopathology in the human cells in this paper, they're doing autopsy samples. So those are people who presumably had a more severe case of COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it lines up well with the macaque data um, in terms of the pathology and what's going on. Yeah, in, their, in, in their autopsy specimens and their analysis of those autopsy specimens, they don't actually look for viral antigen, do they? 
No, they do not. I don't no. think so. And this is this bothers me. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there's I, at, at this point, there's a lot of autopsy material out there, and I don't. I mean, I'm not. I, I don't claim to be uh, omniscient uh, on the literature, but I don't know of any studies where there's been a rigorous analysis uh, by techniques available no. of viral yeah. antigen. Uh, or viral nucleic acid in extra pulmonary tissues. Okay, mm. and I, th this mm. to me needs to be done. Absolutely. That's Remember, really that's point. what Tony yeah, Fauci said, uh, Rich, when we asked him, "Where else is it reproduced?" He said, "We haven't done careful studies like you just mentioned." Yeah. Right? Do you right. do you think that that would um, vary based on timing, Rich? So, well, one perhaps of the problems, if you were too late, yeah. you wouldn't be able to find the virus anymore. Uh, yes, this is a problem: is that you're stuck with autopsy material. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So right. these are mostly people who are way past the viral stage, exactly, uh, and have died. So it could be. I mean, uh, let's put it this way: a negative result wouldn't be meaningful. Right. Right. Okay. So do you think macaques are uh, useful for um, doing studies on reacquisition of infection since they don't die? Uh, it would be very interesting to see how long they remain negative in the face of uh, exposure sure. to Repeated virus challenge. before yes. they become yeah. infected. I, actually, I, I remember that was done early on in, in it, China, right? It was. Right? Actually, yeah. Dan's group has a paper they on have that, a paper too. Um, looking at rechallenge of macaques. I think they're they're not in – they're not uh, – they look for infection or disease, but there's not much disease I, here. I think I they were protected. Recall, disease, I think right. they looked for reinfection, yeah. and I think they. I don't think they looked at a, a lot of time points. Yeah. So I oh, think okay. that they okay. they showed that there was a time point at which um, those macaques were reinfected, but they didn't look at the full kinetics of that response. And there have been some oh, vaccine right. preclinical vaccine studies where they yes. infect macaques or non-human primates and challenge, and there's no. Mm -hmm. infection so that they, they can be protected. Right. But as you know, Dixon, my sly and monkeys exaggerate. Monkeys exaggerate. This is all true. This is all true. You know, I keep forgetting that actually. <laughs> I told that to my, uh, my, I'm on a radio show every Monday morning and uh, I told them that because we were talking about uh, vaccine tri trials and so forth. And uh, he was, he wanted to know about mouse models. And I said, yeah, but you know, what we say is that mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. He said, what does that mean? I have no idea what you're talking about. It's for me to know and for you to find out. Haven't you ever had a conversation with a mouse and a, and a monkey? That's right. That's right. It just, it just means that animal animal models are not perfect representations. Of what no, of course not. But in this paper, um, we do see a pretty good alignment between what we can look at in humans and what is going on in the monkeys. Yeah, um, except and for severity. Rich's, except for severity. Point, it does look like a lot of the pathology is being driven by the immune system rather than the virus. So it's sure. not mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. the virus is doing all this destruction. It's that the immune response is going in there and throwing these But remember, away. it's not severe, as you said, in, in rhesus. Yes. And so there is a difference already there that a difference. for That's some right. reason yeah, you right. can give them lots of virus. They don't develop serious disease. So there's a fundamental right. difference. Right. And, and with that very large caveat um, in mind uh, – this is one reason why the monkey model is potentially useful is you could do yes. things like euthanize at different time points and look for virus infection of different tissues yeah. um, as we're not able to do in humans because we're looking at autopsy samples that are coming rather late. That, of course, assumes that the monkey model and that uh, dissemination in the monkey is the same as humans and monkeys exaggerate. Yes. So we'll see. So humans get lie through this. their teeth. <laughs> get this. Twiv 55. Oh, my October wow. 25th, 2009. Mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. exaggerate. That's okay? incredible. Yeah. You know what we were discussing? XMRV. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what an arc that was. Wow. I, um... <laughs> you were discussing XMRV and I was at Beth Israel at that point. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it could go, uh, it could be mice exaggerate and monkeys lie. The, the point is that they're not faithful representations, they're not perfect models, right? No. They're perfect models. Uh, well, I've always taken the, uh, now that we're delving into this, I've always taken the order of lie and exaggerate as you might think that a primate would be a better model yeah. than yeah, yeah, a yeah. mouse. Okay. So the, the bald faced liars are the mice. Uh, the monkeys maybe are deceiving you a little. It also depends on what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. This is all true. Uh, is all shortly true. after that, 
episode. And I think the uh, H5N1 influenza virus ferret experiments, that was another arc. One of our listeners designed a button, which is still available over at cafepress.com slash microbe TV. And it's got a picture of a mouse, a monkey, and a ferret. And around it, it says, my sly monkeys exaggerate and ferrets are not people. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great what are you going to do about a humanized mouse, Vincent? <laughs> uh, they are people. They are they're semi people? That's right. Yes. Semi people. Do they? Then they lie even more. Then right? right. Well, yeah. in that yeah, case, they, they are. They people. have some pros and cons. <laughs> Um, right. So they also take these the, the lungs of the macaques, they extract RNA and they sequence it. They do what they call RNA seq to see what are all the genes that are being expressed um, mm. on different days, you know, one, two, four, seven, ten, 10, and 14 uh, after challenge. And I want to just tell you, this is not a trivial experiment. It's expensive to do that. Um, by the way, over on Twin this last week, we talked about single cell sequencing of neurons in the brain of wow. people and animals just to, to try and understand the evolution of the brain. And it costs a buck a neuron to do that. Really? And sometimes they're sequencing 200,000 <clears throat> in one paper, 200,000 neurons. Yeah. That's a lot of money. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Uh, so, and I was just thinking about how difficult these experiments are in terms of data analysis and sort of computational skills. That too. But oh. it's also cost. It's not cheap to do science. Never has been. Anyway, they say what genes are expressed and they find signatures associated with coagulation, thrombosis, and vascular disease, sure. um, as well as uh, inflammation, um, all these things that we're probably driving the uh, the clotting and and, and so forth. Um, they also uh, they say that this confirms our histopathology and, and the anatomical observations. These are the right genes that we would expect to be upregulated uh, in them. They see inflammatory pathways upregulated, pro-inflammatory cytokines that are being produced that are probably driving these processes. Uh, they find um, certain macrophage types. Uh, upregulated that are they may, may be also driving uh, and they say these monocytes may bind the endothelium and uh, uh, cause damage on their own as well. There's, uh, there's a little bit of evidence in the immunology literature that I've been reading lately about macrophages also producing some of these clotting factors. Yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah. so that could be mm. tied together as well. Wow. So they say these histopathologic transcriptomic and proteomic, they also do proteome a sequencing of the protein suggests the critical role of active, activated macrophages in the pathogenesis uh, in rhesus macaques. They also see activation of complement pathways, which can also lead to cell damage uh, as well. So that is my takeaway is mm, mm. upregulation of inflammatory and complement pathways leads to recruitment of macrophages and neutrophils, activation of platelets, adhesion and aggregation at the site of vascular industry triggering of coagulation, resulting in endothelial damage and thrombosis. So that's the sequence of inflammatory events. Of course, all subsequent to virus infection, that starts it all. You know, the virus, it's kind of hit and run. I'm here and I'm gone. And then right. and the damage right. occurs. But now- And then since the monkeys recover, it means that they they back off this process. Apparently, subsequently. yeah. Yes, so this in whole fact, inflammatory and clotting process gets ramped up, does the damage, gives you these results that are similar to the damage you see in human lungs and so forth, um, and then yeah. it's going to it's gonna come back down again. Apparently, the they, they regulate it. So, that, yeah, it's a good point because— And that is, that is presumably what's happening. So, uh, you know, we're obviously not doing autopsies on people who recover. Um, to, uh, so they're presumably— going to have that same type of curve of response where the cough subsides and they get better and the inflammation has gone down, whereas the people who end up on the autopsy table are the ones who weren't able to stop this cascade because of whatever else it is in their immune system that is that is not able to stop. Yeah. It. It, it'd be great to know how the macaques actually regulate the, yes. and turn off this process um, so that and we could absolutely. try to mimic it in right and i'm therapy. sure 
Brian is familiar with this in, in recent years, there's been this revelation in immunology where people used to think, oh, inflammation is you've got all this inflammatory stuff and then you take away the inflammatory stuff and, it, and the inflammation just stops. Mm -hmm. But it's not like that. No. It's the inflammation gets turned on, yes, you take away the inflammatory stuff, but then there's this other it's whole regulatory off. system that has to come in and mm -hmm. actively turn off the inflammation. And I think that's probably something like that is going on. Alan, have you been in my research lab lately? I have not been in your research lab. <laughs> I went to a conference about resolution of inflammation at the, I covered it for the New York Academy of Sciences about a year and a half ago, I think. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. like, wow, this is just. <laughs> so this whole um, progression, this whole cascade, is uh, uh, not a common theme in respiratory infections, mm -hmm. right? This That's is, correct. This That's is right. a SARS-CoV-2 right. thing. Yes. There may be other viruses that do it. I don't know how, how closely other viruses have been looked at. But mm -hmm. this, this uh, uh, I mean, the SARS-CoV-2 infection has been uh, called uh, clinically an atypical pneumonia. Yeah. And this is sort of down at the molecular level, some insight into... That atypicality, if that's a word, yes. is that a word, Alan? So, uh, uh, yes. You mean this is not okay. like the flu? It's not like you're getting the flu, Rich? No. Yeah. So, Gee whiz. So that, raise, so that raises the issue in my mind is why? Why? It must have to do with, um, you know, all of these viruses tinker with the innate immune response. And it must be... It may reflect uh, have the to bat do with the exact origins. pattern of that tinkering yeah. in the case of this particular infection. It, it may reflect How the bat. It may reflect the bat origins of these viruses, yeah. where yeah. Yeah. you know there. What is it, Brian? Bats. The interferon's always on in bats. And that so, interferon is always on, and some innate really? immune genes are missing or mutated. So maybe um, these, you know, these viruses evolved in bats for for millions of years, and maybe they're used to whamming the innate system, and then they find themselves in a wimpy m uh, human host. Uh, where you don't need to do that, but it happens anyway because they've been doing it for millions of years, and then this is the consequence. But you know, yep. it differs in people. From you know, there's a person issue, there's a genetic issue as well. It's not just a virus. Mm -hmm. so, right. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and we'll hopefully learn in in coming years uh, what's going on. Right, and what we see with flu is um, totally it, in a lot of cases, it's it's also in flu, not the virus that's killing people. But it's not the immune system either. It's the subsequent bacterial infection that you get after the flu mm. came in and caused the damage and mucked with your immune system. And then mm. you get pneumonia and then you, you know, you, mm. the bacterial infection kills you. Sometimes there's right. a primary and, and viral be, pneumonia as well, though. Sometimes that will Sometimes, yes. Sometimes the virus yeah. as well will do it. And that, you know, as an immunologist is also fascinating because is flu knocking down your immune system such that those bacterial infections yes. are more likely? Right. So they say at the end, you know, we have now interferon, inflammation, coagulation, complement pathways, so we can maybe target those for therapeutics. And I would say, you know, Daniel's always talking about using anticoagulants at a certain point in the infection, not early, you know, or um, right. steroids, not early, but later in infection. And that's already being done. Uh, and it makes sense now in, in light of these data. But you have and to if time you can it. find drugs, I know people are looking at these for a whole bunch of things, but if you can find drugs that trigger the active shutdown of inflammation, the, the resolvins, the, all that sort of stuff that Brianne works on, um, then that could give you a way in to address not only this, but a whole bunch of other things. All right. Our last brevia is a PNAS paper out of Ralph Barrick's lab with collaborators in various places. Swine acute diarrhea syndrome coronavirus replication in primary human cells reveals potential susceptibility to infection. So SADS coronavirus, I love the name. It is a Have we talked about this one yeah, before? Yeah, we did. We talked yeah. to, it was a big outbreak in China um, yeah. a number of years ago. And we talked about it, the paper that came out subsequently to that. So yeah, sad. I, I thought we had a diarrhea arc going on here. <laughs> we had a diarrhea. So this is a virus that. <laughs> and and you're welcome, listeners. I've now given you that <laughs> mental image. So if, if monkeys lie in mice, what do pigs do? What do pigs do? Well, here's the way uh, I look at it. What do you do with this paper? Projectile diarrhea. <laughs> in my view, 
pigs are the most <laughs> like people, or maybe people are the most yeah, like pigs. Yeah, you could reverse well, that. Yeah. They know what's going to happen. That's the problem. Um, <laughs> and, and in the fact, in terms of, of uh, virus, I mean, you know, a lot of our human influenza viruses do very well in pigs. Yeah, sure. Uh, and there are a lot of pigs globally because it's a big source of protein, right? Yes, uh, sure. But we talked about SADS coronavirus. It's a virus that spilled over from bats, rhinolophus bats in China, into pigs and causes massive diarrhea in very young pigs, piglets, and they die from dehydration. And, Something uh, like ninety percent lethality in pigs. Wow. Or yeah. it's, so it's there were huge, there were huge loss of farms that get hit with this because it becomes epidemic in the. In the swine sure, facility. Sure. There were a series of um, spillovers that caused outbreaks on different farms of tens of thousands of pigs dying. And this is a big deal in China because it's a major source of protein, right? Um, so, and there are actually It'd other- be a big deal in North Carolina, too. Are there are a lot of pigs there? <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. Are you that's joking? A, there's a- No, uh, sure. That's like the center of the- If you buy pork in your supermarket, good chance it was grown in- in North Carolina. Jimmy oh, Dean you know, that, that reminds me, uh, Alan, Prince Prince did you go to the- Smith premium ham, you've got a lot of different- Alan, did you go to the University of Delaware or Maryland? I went to Towson University, which is part of the, the university- Neither one. System. Oh, it's Maryland? Okay. Because no. we had some guests last week. Uh, one yes, of them and, and was, Maryland is very particular that we are not Delaware. We're uh, a thinking yeah, man's yeah. Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one of our guests went to the University of Delaware, and they said that— Thinking on Delaware is a big part of being from Maryland. The three states, <laughs> Delaware, Maryland, and the third, have more chickens than anywhere else in the U.S. Yes. Yeah, that's Frank, probably Frank right. Frank Perdue is a um, uh, big guy. Well, I that's mean, right. his son now, a uh, big guy on the eastern shore of Maryland. Uh, Maryland, so, uh, Delaware, what's the third state? Does the brand, do you remember what they said? But for I chickens, think it was I think chickens. it was Virginia because it was the Delmarva Peninsula. Delmarva Peninsula. Okay. All right. So there you have chickens the in here. Delmarva Peninsula, by the way, is actually an island, but that's getting dark. <laughs> so, I was just thinking about Del Mar and Va. Yes, it's Delaware, Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, it's the eastern side of the Chesapeake Bay, yeah, 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 um, yeah. and there's a canal that was dug across the very northern part of that that then turns the Delmarva Peninsula into an island. And the runoff from those farms into the Chesapeake Bay has caused enormous ecological problems. Yep. Enormous. So this isn't the only coronavirus to, to wreak havoc in pigs. Uh, transmissible gastroenteritis virus is one. Porcine respiratory coronavirus. Porcine, epi porcine epidemic diarrhea coronavirus. Porcine hemagglutinating encephalomyelitis virus and porcine delta coronavirus and then and there's sads. also apart from the coronaviruses isn't there another swine virus that just burned through um yeah birds globally or or it was, oh, african, swine african fever, swine or? fever. African there's yeah, another one there's another one um, there's an anello virus or something like that well right? our whole public or, health program a meat inspection uh, in the united states at least centers around the outbreaks of uh, uh hog cholera Hmm. Um, which if it gets into one pig, they kill a hundred mile radius of pigs to get rid of it. Hmm. We, we talked you, about, this was on a previous twist. We did too, talk about it? it. And we you know, um, XJ Meng works on a portion. No, that's the coronavirus. A African swine fever. That's a, Yeah, but there's another one too that. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I, you've got it. XJ Meng. XJ it's Meng. A, it's uh, like a, uh, a, a circovirus of some sort. Yeah, Successful here we go. Systems oh. attract parasites. And by yes, the way, you know the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. There you go. They're tightly associated. That's where XJ is. Uh, epi uh, at porcine epidemic diarrhea virus. PED PEDV. I'd really be interested to know why feral pigs don't die off at the same rate that domestic pigs do because they all came from the same stocks. Feral pigs throughout the world are causing huge damage. And these virus infections should be wiping them out, but the hey, Dixon, hybrid vigor, distribution issue, <laughs> hybrid vigor, <laughs> hybrid well, no, vigor. <laughs> no, I think um, I think a lot of it is just that the reason the reason you lose um, so many pigs to these on a farm is because you have so many pigs. Oh, yeah, in no, one place. no, no question about uh, And it, no if they spread to the wild it. swine, they might take out one sounder of them. Sure, um, but sure, then sure. there are six other sounders in the area that are going to go oh, through and they right. reproduce at such an absurd rate in they the do. wild that you'd yeah. have to wipe out something like 60% of them every year in order to, to yeah, even yeah, make yeah. a den. That's right. That's right. 
Well, I'm, you know I'm, why uh, PC uh, the porcine circle virus came up? I'm just reading about this. Is another old arc. Uh, there was contamination of the Rotatec vaccine with yeah. PCV2. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. Oops. And by the way, uh, Dixon classical swine fever is a pesty virus. Wow. Right. It's a toga. Uh, were you possibly thinking of porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome? Yes, yes. Which is caused by a port <laughs> RT virus? Nidoviralis is it's another coronavirus, yeah. Maybe that, that's what I was thinking of, though. PRRS, I think, ripped through North America. Okay. Yes, uh, if you search ProMed, you can find quite a few posts about it. So there are a bunch of pig viruses. And also, of course, influenza oh, yeah. viruses can wreak havoc yes. in pigs. Yes. So, um, the reason, so the reason... Um, Ralph and his crew were working on swine acute diarrhea syndrome coronavirus is because this is right up right up the alley of of SARS-CoV-2. This is this is highly spill relevant. Over, yeah. It's zoonotic for pigs and the question is is it zo potentially zoonotic for people? Right? So how do you do that? You take cell lines and you infect them or you take cells primary cells, right? Right. So they recover virus and, and- And the reason you do this, just to, in case anybody was unclear on this, is um, we know that SARS-CoV-2 came from bats in China and we had warning shots about this possibility for years beforehand. And and in fact, there's even a sentence in the introduction here that they're talking about SARS-1 and then MERS. And then as these data forecast, a new Sarpico virus recently emerged in Wuhan, China in 2019, yep, SARS-CoV-2. Yep. So in other words, we saw this coming. We did. And so now let's look at this swine acute diarrhea syndrome coronavirus because that could be the next thing. Yeah, unfortunately, we knew this. In fact, we have had a yeah. um, number of people on who talked about the early data after SARS-1 where they pulled these viruses out of bats and said, yeah, they, and Ralph and others, they can infect human yeah. cells. And so they are a threat. And, and uh, you know, it wasn't paid attention to, sadly. So here they ask, can these SADS coronaviruses infect human cells? So they take some cell lines in the lab and show that, yes, the virus can infect them. But what I think is more interesting is they take uh, cells from the respiratory tract of humans, uh, different kinds of primary cells where you would go in and take out little clumps, put them in culture, and then infect them. Uh, and they find, in fact, that these viruses can infect those cells, those primary cells. So we got primary human lung cells, which include microvascular endothelial cells, fibroblasts, nasal epithelium, and airway epithelium. All of them can be infected with SADS-CoV. So that means, now that doesn't mean that these viruses are gonna cause a pandemic, but they have the potential to infect people. And if they do, they could spread and acquire other changes that they might need to become, you know, a virus that can really spread extensively in humans. Now, yeah, I would even argue that we've kind of um, uh, vigorously done the experiment on whether these can cause a pandemic with all these outbreaks that are happening in, in swine. Um, I mean, this is, you got a, a whole farm full of, pigs with diarrhea and workers handling them and everything. Yeah, there you go. And nobody, I'm sure, was paying a whole lot of attention to the biological safety aspects when they're looking at losing 90% of their herd. No. So no. there's already been a lot of human exposure to these. We haven't yet gotten the spillover event. Um, what I take away from that, though, and this paper, which shows that it can infect the relevant cell types, is we may just be a few mutations away from this happening. Yeah. We should. And so they asked, do any humans have sera that could protect against this? Because this is related to, it's a alpha coronavirus. So it's related to two of the four common cold coronas. They don't block infection, but they do show that remdesivir does inhibit virus reproduction. So, you know, that's okay, but remdesivir has to be given intravenously and there are kinds of issues with that. So I would say, yeah, what Alan said, you have people working on farms amongst pigs who have diarrhea, that's, uh, they're probably constantly exposed. We should probably look in them and see if they have antibodies yeah. against mm -hmm. this virus, which might suggest, you know, some abortive infection already happening. Yeah. 
So, Vincent, you may recall that I um, intimated in one of my mistake statements a long time ago that most of the pigs of China were raised outdoors, <laughs> and I got a nasty letter from somebody from China, <laughs> rightly so, telling me that over 80% of the pigs are now being raised indoors. So now I'm questioning how do these pigs catch this infection? Not from each other, but from probably people coming and going between the farms mm -hmm indoors it's an indoor born infection and when you've crowded the pigs so tightly in place it's no wonder that you get a, a a huge hit when the virus actually does enter that building well and it could be coming in on the pigs um because pigs are traded globally. yeah you're right no you're absolutely so right. you bring in you bring sure, in a sure, constant sure, supply sure. of fresh pigs to your facility that's going to feed them and fatten them up to a particular stage yeah, and that may no, be a high-rise right. building absolutely. Um, and uh, this this could come in that way. In fact, in the United States, that's exactly how it works because we've got piglet farms right. that then put those pigs to some other kind of farm for their fattening up and then their slaughter. So, uh, yeah, there's a whole – it's an incredible industry when you look at the details of it. And uh, it's hard to estimate the effects of the loss of that protein source for a country as large as China – which depends on very little else for their protein hit. Fish, yes, but pork is their main, main go-to meat. And uh, that's going to really um, have an effect, I guess, Brianne, on their immune system, and their ability to resist common infections, which now become uncommon infections. And maybe that's the trigger that allows this to spill over. In a malnourished individual that's immunosuppressed because of that, maybe viruses that ordinarily wouldn't infect people suddenly gain entrance and that sort of thing. I don't know. Just a speculation, but it's uh, it's all tied together in some the way. Pig, the pig, the global pig trade is uh, quite extensive. It's enormous. It's enormous. And Absolutely China enormous. imports a lot of pigs. In addition to raising them, they import from various countries, and that can That's contribute right. to That's the right. passage. So I what, mean, what it, should we do? So we should definitely monitor. They should have these people working on the farms, bet. check them periodically. And right. I would say, let's make some antivirals that can inhibit all of these uh, coron SARS like coronaviruses, the coronaviruses that cause SADS, uh, which is what we should have done before, okay, before SARS CoV 2. But now we have the opportunity to do it. So if something does spill over and start spreading, we can treat people right away. And I really hope that remdesivir is not the answer. You need something that if you have a PCR positive, you can pop a couple of pills and it will inhibit. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I hope we do that. I'm not convinced that we will. I'm just I don't have a lot of faith. <laughs> yeah, and we need we need more monitoring for this at earlier stages. I mean, yeah, yeah. okay, That's so right. we're looking That's at right. a pig virus that can spill over into humans, but it didn't start in pigs. It started in bats. And yeah. we need to be looking, and in fact, they even mentioned, I think, in the discussion of the paper, that we need to be looking in the wild for the viruses that can spill over, anticipating those, developing the countermeasures in advance of that, Mm -hmm. um, in order to be ready for this type of event in the future. But of course, Alan, the um, administration suspended a grant that was meant yes. just to do that very thing Yes, in all sure. of its wisdom, just for political yeah. purposes, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, well it, And it would also be nice um, looking at, say, the phylogenetic tree they show here, maybe to start thinking about vaccines that uh, protect against all of these coronaviruses yes. that they're showing in this tree. Oh, they, um, would, they would love one for the pigs, I'm sure of that. Well, and they're, but they're, because there are conserved features, exactly. you could potentially develop some kind of uh, pan spike vaccine um, mm -hmm. that gives sure. you, maybe not against all of them, but against a, a spectrum of them that would give you yeah, some degree sure. of immunity against this whole Vaccines, group. pan sp vaccines, antivirals, we could do this. Yeah. Um, we should be doing this. Uh, but I remember Tony Shounts, he said, the bats don't worry me. The deer mice, the mice worry me. <laughs> huh? A lot of viruses. And of course, deer mice are susceptible to SARS-CoV-2, but they also have lots of viruses of their own. So lots, And there are lots of exposures of uh, humans and mice. Personally, I have lots of exposures with stink bugs. Um, so today in my, uh, here at home, it's weird. In my home office, I'm in the basement. Periodically, they just drop out of the, we have a drop ceiling. 
they just drop onto my desk. The other one, day, one landed right on the mic when I was podcasting. <laughs> you know what they? You know they look like they're a little yeah. brownish. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and sure, sure. they go plop. They make a noise, and then they're they dead. Do. They're dead. <laughs> At least they could do is silence their microphone. <laughs> well, I figured he had something, he or she had something to say and wanted to get close. Uh, yeah, well. Because, you know, when you get close, you have the proximity yeah. effect. Yes, All right. Well, and if you're going to worry about stink bugs, I'm going to worry about the time I spend on a college campus and all the squirrels. Squirrels, uh, too. There's a ton of them out there right squirrels. now, isn't there? Do you, yeah, you have, we, have uh, a, we have a plethora of squirrels in our neighborhood as well. Do you have the dark I think ones? This is for you? last year for uh, acorns, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Uh. We don't have any dark ones, but we have quite a lot of squirrels. And what kind of squirrel viruses could there be? Lots. Oh lots. They oh have uh, the dark ones on Princeton campus, the dark squirrels. It's really yeah. interesting. Um, plenty of uh, squirrels. Everything has viruses, right? Even stink bugs. Yeah, they used mm -hmm. to talk about industrial melanization, but I'm not sure that holds true anymore. No, I don't think that's true for the squirrels. No, but that's how they started, though. Okay. The squirrels started by industrial, like the moths? By being yes, yes, by being selected uh, in England and in other places, also by predators that could mm. recognize the lighter colored animals rather than the darker colored animals. Okay, so. there you go. That is our brevia for today. We hope you've learned Indeed. something. You can send. Yeah, us. It only only took an hour. <laughs> you know, not so. No, brevia. We did. This uh, is not so brevia. Hour. We did three papers and a debunking. That's pretty good. And now we have so now we have some email, and Dixon, I saved this one for yes. you. I I I sensed that actually. <laughs> so here we go. Email Uncle Rinkus writes, and we'll get to the meaning of that later. Twiv one, I have been listening since March when a friend turned me on to your podcast. Like most of your emailers, I have found you to be a rock of solid information on the pandemic, and I very much appreciate the public service you are all providing. So a sincere thanks to you and the entire team and to your guests as well. My question is for my brother and his family. They got antibody tests back in June. and My brother, his wife, and their teenage daughter all had IgG, and the wife had both IgG and IgA. Hmm. Didn't know they tested for that, mm -hmm. actually. They had no known exposures and only got the antibody tests because their family physician recommended it before seeing other family members. Thank you. I knew this made no sense at the time, but that is what they did. On follow-up PCR, no one was positive. In this case, it seems it would be a very low likelihood that these are four false positive results. I should mention the husband and wife have not been sick this year at all, and the daughter had a cold in early March. They are located in Southern California, so this would be an early case, though they say that the cold weather uh, went around the school, that, that, that the cold went around the school. Other than the daughter's brief cold in March, no sickness and no known exposures. Occam's razor would seem to go with the daughter having been infected in March and the parents both having asymptomatic infections. Fortunately, no one in their cohort became sick after they did. This episode predated contact tracing and PCR test availability in Southern California. So the question we have is whether is, it is risky for someone in their situation to also get a vaccine when, if it becomes available. Are the phase three trials doing antibody tests on the volunteers beforehand? So we might know if there's an increased risk. Then he writes, tight lines, signs it Onkorinkus. P.S. Dixon should appreciate my screen name. DDD, that's me. I love it. It's the genus name for all Pacific Ocean salmon and U.S. Western slope trouts, cutthroat and rainbow. It refers to the male fish in that genus when they develop a protuberance from their lower and sometimes upper jaw as well during the mating season called a kipe. They use their kipe to bite at the vent of female salmonids, stimulating them to release their eggs so the male can then fertilize them. What do you mean too much information? I live for this stuff. Then I found this wonderful picture of a uh, sea wren brown trout uh, that's uh, got a gigantic kipe in its lower jaw and a groove in its upper jaw to make room for it so that it can close its mouth. Dixon, what does it mean, tight lines? That means um, enjoy yourself, have a good day, best wishes. It's the fisherman's best wish for another fisherman. 
or person, fish or person, I should say. Because you have a tight line when you're reeling one in. You do, you do, you do, you do. But I often <laughs> uh, get that letter uh, signed by my editor, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> tight line. See, it yeah, seems, exactly right. seems to me that... And we have a number um, of versions of that, but, it, but it's a good story. And I wonder where he, uh, I guess he must fish. I, it seems to me that these people had... We're sure positive, but the PCR was done af long after, and the, the infection was resolved by then. That's why Absolutely. they were negative, yeah. right? Would, would they have looked for IgA also? Oh, that's weird. That I don't know of anyone looking for IgA. Do you, Brianne? Yeah, I mean, there must have been a complete panel of uh, yeah. IgE, IgD, IgM, Ig. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my fr my first thought was, what test was this? And yeah, exactly, right. exactly um, right. Exactly right. Exactly. I mean, it's right. it's a brilliant stroke of luck that nobody in the house got sick if they all, in fact, had this virus, because it seems like. Yeah, well, the she odds would favor somebody at least having more than a light cough. But we had a sequence. We had a sequence their genomes. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You bet. Um, you know, but yeah, it's it, it's possible. Early March is pretty early. Uh, Southern California is the right place to one sure. of the right places to have gotten this. Then though, um, and so yeah, they could all have been exposed. I, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I just went back and read this letter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dominate. Go dominate. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm pretty sure the other TWIV hosts can jump in if I'm out of line. <laughs> uh, uh, we're not no, shy. I think, um, I think, yeah, it, it looks like they, they may have had an exposure, but they probably aren't infectious now, right? No. no, no. PC, I mean, it's, it's unlikely there were three false negatives on the PCR. Right. Mm -hmm. I would just right. say it so was. So what about? <laughs> so I don't, uh, I don't see anything wrong with getting vaccinated. No, no. Even if they're already seropositive. What I don't know is, uh, well, uh, I presume, and I think I've read places that uh, people will be screened serologically as they enter a trial. Yes. Yeah. What I yeah. don't know is whether if you are seropositive. For SARS-CoV-2, whether that uh, excludes you from the trial. My understanding from the presentations that I saw was that it does not, at least from the trials where they mentioned that, although people can go on clinicaltrials.gov and look up protocols if they want the details on all of those. Um, and, and they're also being screened for current infection, of course. So you get a SARS-CoV-2 PCR test and you get an antibody test. And um, so they're going to be... Um, they should be vaccinating some people who already have antibodies. Um, if the antibodies turn out to be a problem with the vaccine, then I think that's probably a vaccine that shouldn't go to market. Yeah, it right. seems to me, uh, you know, thinking about it, I think you would want to include those people yes. in the trial because right. the the sort of consistent, the the real sort of one of the fears about adverse effects is uh antibody dependent enhancement of disease and uh you know it might show up in individuals who are vaccinated on top of an infection uh yeah. and so uh that you know that's important right the question will be whether they have enough of those individuals to do good statistics right. um but there should at least be a hint um i know how much statisticians love the word trend so i wasn't saying it yes. um but there may be some evidence yeah, point. and and if you um, if anybody's wondering if this is just idle speculation, you can Google Dengvaxia, D E N G V A X I A, yeah, exactly. for a real horror story. Uh, different yeah, virus, exactly. different vaccine, um, in, but it's a vaccine going into humans that caused uh, uh, some really bad problems. But but remember, with Dengvaxia and with the antibody dependent enhancement issue that Rich mentioned, that's a situation where people were getting sick when they yes. got actual infection following vaccination. Yes. Right. It's not that the vaccine had an effect. Right. Um, without additional infection. Right. Right. Um, but that is, that is also something um, now dengue viruses are special there. Yeah. And in fact, going into that, the, the company involved in that trial was roundly and correctly criticized because experts in dengue virus were saying, do not release this vaccine. You're, you're making a big mistake. And then what they had forecast came to pass. Um, so there are lots of lawsuits and there should be, um, that was a vaccine that nobody in the U S got it as far as I know, but, um, or was that, 
approved by the FDA? No, no, I don't was think not. So. Uh, but Just, that was, uh, it was widely deployed. Mexico, in Philippines, Philippines, and, and Brazil, and I think. Some other yeah. tropical countries and, yeah. and anyway. Um, we wouldn't so need it here. if there's we're... something like that going on with SARS-CoV-2, we kind of think there probably won't be, but there could be um, based on other coronaviruses. And, and if that happens on subsequent infection with a vaccine, that would also be something we'd really want to know about before we release the thing. Correction. And that's definitely something they're looking for in the trial. Yeah. Correction. Yeah, that is very much being looked for. Correction. If, uh, Tengvaxia is FDA approved. It is FDA approved. Okay. Yeah. And so and the deal is, I think if you've, you should only get it if you're sure you've never had dengue before. Right. Yeah, I think it's that's type right. two, right. especially type two. But of course, you're not going to be right. serotype. But yes, the yeah. broad and the reason the FDA approved it is because the U.S. territories, American Samoa, Guam, yes. Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, have endemic dengue. Have so dengue. it's sure. important to do that. All right, yeah. it's important so to this, check this your is facts. Also, why it's important for those trials to run long enough that we would see an effect like that. Here, here. Alan, can you take the next one? Sure. Um, and this was actually a, an email that was sent direct to me, um, but I thought we should put it on the show. This is from Art. Um, it says, uh, hi, Alan. I enjoy listening to TWIV. And in your last episode, 667, you reminded me of an Air Force Reserve C-130A flight that I was on as a co-pilot in the mid-70s out of Niagara Falls, New York. Um, the day before, another flight from our 328th Tactical Air Squadron had picked up a mission to fly to Brownsville, Texas, and pick up some pallets of lunchbox screw worms <laughs> that were about to hatch and transport them over to the Naval Air Station in Puerto Rico to be offloaded onto smaller planes to be dropped over cattle fields. The screw worms had been radiated and were ready to hatch and do their thing to reduce the fly population in Puerto Rico. Um, the flight crew, uh, the flight broke down and could not complete the mission. So the next day, our crew relieved them and flew down to Brownsville loaded the pallets and took off for Roosevelt Road's Naval Air Station in Puerto Rico. Inside each of the hundreds of cardboard boxes with the irradiated screw worms was straw with a cup of something, dried blood and honey, as I recall, to keep the few flies that might hatch convinced to stay in the boxes, which were not sealed. Didn't work. <laughs> flies started hatching en masse. They were supposed to be in Puerto Rico already, exiting the boxes, and soon we had a swarm on the flight deck and all over the cargo area. The flight engineer suggested we turn on all air conditioning units to quiet down the flies. That helped. So as night closed in, we had subdued flies sitting around on the windscreen and everywhere else for our hours-long flight into Puerto Rico. We made it in to land with a cabin temp down to 38 degrees Fahrenheit and a horrible smell. At the parking ramp, the customs guy came on board with bug spray going in both hands, and we exited quickly to the chow hall. Keep up your excellent work with everyone on TWIV. I'm very grateful for all your good info on the virus problems and solutions. Um, and he also sends 73 from WA1AAY. That's a ham radio thing. Um, Art. Uh, Brown class of 1968 is in Pittsburgh, New York. Uh, P.S. He says, never would have gone into the Air Force, but I got three years off from my engineer job at Kodak for bad behavior. Richard Nixon's, not mine. <laughs> when I was when I lost the draft lottery in 1969 and enlisted for pilot training and six-year active duty, reserve duty in the Air Force before the Army could get me. Um, so, uh, draft, draft lottery. Why, why did he think, of, did you mention screw worms on that episode? Yeah, Can, so that was, we were talking about sterile insect technique. I think yeah. this came up in the That was a of, pick of the week with mis, uh, engineered mosquitoes. Yes, so engineered the, mosquitoes. And the idea with this, for people who didn't catch that, is that um, you, you release sterile males into a population. They mate with the females who then lay sterile eggs that don't hatch. And if you do this repeatedly, you, in the old days, they would sterilize the males by irradiating them. Um, and you do this repeatedly, and eventually you can eradicate a species, which is why we don't have screw worm flies, uh, which is a horrible parasite of cattle um, in the United States anymore. And you have to, uh, you have to also say that uh, screw worms only mate once. Yes. Uh, so and, and, and the reason why it's a cattle disease in the U.S. is because we use a lot of barbed wire. Yes. And they get injured, and that's where they lay their eggs. Otherwise, if you had free-ranging cattle, they wouldn't be a problem. So they were you dropping these. The brush off your property. They were dropping yeah. these over cattle fields, but they were yeah. they would not infect the cattle, right? They would. Oh, uh, no. They would mate with females. The that's females right. infect the cattle to lay their eggs. Exactly. 
So it causes something called furuncular myiasis, uh, which humans mm. can also get if you get a fly leg. You it's eggs are in a cut. right. You are right. Um, so what happens is that the the eggs will hatch in the cut. The maggots will then eat their way out. Um, oh, goody! <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and this causes obviously an injury, which can get subsequent infections and mm. can make the cattle very sick. And the this hides are totally useless. The hides the become industries. completely useless. Yeah. And this I will reminds- be taking a long shower after yes. this. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me of a, a disease that used to show up in the squirrels in Florida with these huge, ah. big lesions right. that had to do with. Eggs under the skin hatching in the maggots is entirely possible. That's a that could be a a myiasis as well. Yep, Hmm. Rich. When the guy said, uh, the the guy came on board with uh, insect spray and we went to the chow hall, I thought that'd be Rich Condit. He's stinky (laughs) plane for hours, he's gonna go eat. (laughs) That's right, they're gonna eat. I'm gonna eat. (laughs) Uh, well, the thing I the thing I zero in on here is uh, the draft lottery. Yeah, and me in too. 1969, that was probably the first round of the lottery. Okay. I was in that. Me too. Okay? I won it. You did. It was uh, a great day. How did you win it? What was your number? 352. Oh, I was 327. Oh you were what? I was, I, I was 327. I was 28. It's amazing. Dixon. Did you no, get. They didn't even come close to that number. No? Nope. Huh. I, I remember my father was really happy, and, and uh, I said, "Wow, he likes me." <laughs> uh, it's uh, it, notice here, fans, that all these guys remember their draft numbers. Oh yeah, yes. yes. oh yes, yeah. yeah, yep, yeah, me too. Um, Rich, can you take the next one? Sure. Ellen writes. Hang on, uh, get over here. Oh, okay. Ellen writes, dear Twiv, I am a retired science editor who loves your lengthy podcast, <laughs> which I listen to during my nightly bouts of geriatric insomnia. <laughs> In reference to the cruelty of nature, try reading Mother Nature is a Wicked Old Witch, a 1993 paper by the late evolutionary biologist George C. Williams of SUNY Sto- Stony Brook, Ellen in New York City. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I have not read this. But I will. Anybody out there? Have you guys read this? I haven't I read haven't. that one, but uh, okay, we'll take the, re- yeah. the, the Revenge of Gaia isn't uh, far behind that one. If I okay, uh, you can download it on the on the web. Okay, we will do this. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. And and Dixon, you have a suge- yes? you have a suggestion. I do. It's the Revenge of Gaia by Richard Ludlock, one of the co-discoverers of the Gaia hypothesis with Lynn Margulis. Is this all and, about uh, how evil and cruel nature yeah, is? Yeah, I mean, when you damage nature, nature fights back. And you'll mm. see in my pick of the week how that's okay. uh, coming full circle. We can actually take advantage of it now. Okay. Who's that a commercial? It's not nice to fool Mother Nature. Exactly yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> we do know this, don't we? The reason why bats are encroaching into human space is because it's not that way. It's the other way. Right? <laughs> it's the other way. So... If you want to know why these things are showing up more frequently, that's the reason. Brianne, can you take the next one? Sure. Megan writes, Dear TWIV team, I write to you from Montana. Mm. I am a family physician at an FQHC. I don't know what that stands for. Um, And I am also the local public health officer. I am deep in the trenches of this pandemic. Montana has been spared the virus so far, except that we have experienced all of the shutdown stress, pandemic preparation, and anxiety. Now that we are fully exhausted, we are seeing a uh, surge at levels completely unprecedented before. And I see someone has mentioned that FQHC is a federally (laughs) qualified health center. Um, Our governor has been a good leader, but as we have gotten closer to the election, it has become apparent that he will not shut anything down further due to concerns for his election. (laughs) He has instead encouraged local officials to work harder on mitigation. I will tell you that while our public health department has had overwhelming support from the entire medical community, as well as the local hospital, our larger community has been less than helpful. Our city and county leaders have not lifted a finger to help us. Our hospital has been overwhelmed as they have multiple sick staff members. We have been unable to transfer patients out of our small hospital due to the burden our larger hospitals are carrying. Our hospital can only take three COVID patients before impacting our ability to provide routine care. 
we only have 8,500 people in our county. My typical day includes working a full schedule in the clinic, seeing a mixture of patients in person and with telehealth. Noon hour is when I assist with swabbing at our clinic's drive through clinic, even on my days off. Evenings are spent in contact tracing. We have had so many cases and so many contacts to trace that there are not enough hours in the day to keep up with this or make any difference in transmission. The rest of the time I spend in school board and public health meetings where I am denigrated by the public. I have been astounded at the vitriol from our community members and my husband and I have at times been concerned for my safety. We are also strongly considering moving away. People who were previously my friends no longer speak to me. I have attached an article written by our mayor. He intends to be read to the public at a future meeting and for some reason vote on the statement. I have written letters to the paper and given lectures at the Board of Health meetings trying to fight misinformation. Your podcast ensures that I stay up to date in this fight. I attach this article by our mayor as I want to show you the level of misinformation we are dealing with. I need assistance in tearing this apart. Recently, our local coroner, in Montana, a coroner just has to have a high school degree, stated at a public meeting that masks were causing an increase in cardiac fatalities. Hypoxia? People clapped after she stated this. I do not need to tell you she presented no data. Is it not true that we can not base mask effectiveness decisions on naked viral particle size? My understanding is that bear virus is wimpy and has its external case sheared apart. I think it is more important to review droplet aerosol size that the virus is contained in. I don't think you can discuss masks without discussing the contribution they may have to decreasing viral load. I have also included an article that shows that viral load may correlate to mortality. I know you have said that viral load only correlates to infectivity, but this article shows it may correlate to mortality. I know there is another study that shows the same viral loads in asymptomatic symptomatic people, so this may not be an appropriate conclusion. Lastly, I would encourage you to read The Death of Expertise. This book has helped me understand this misinformation pandemic. It has also given me the gumption as an expert to fight this misinformation. One thing to keep in mind, physicians would speak out more, I believe, but in a small town, they do not want to lose patients, which are our primary source of income. If they make a statement that is scientifically based, but perceived as politically biased, they will lose patients. I myself know for certain that I have lost patients simply by being the public health officer. Hmm. Thanks for listening, Megan. Um, and Megan sends us an article from The Lancet um, on September 1st called SARS-CoV-2 viral load predicts COVID-19 mortality. So the problem with this and other similar papers is that they're one point of virus determination. And yeah. often the very sick people are already in hospital and they say, oh, here's the virus, but they don't compare it to anything. They compare it to high, healthy people who are not in the hospital and they're different time points. You need to have a time course to be able to prove this. And nobody has done that yet. It's hard, right? A person comes into yeah. hospital gasping for breath. You're not going to do a time course <laughs> before they got there and afterwards. So I'm not at all convinced that uh, the, the viral load predicts mortality. And there are like four or five papers out there besides this one. Um, not at all convinced by the data. So, um, Me but the Me so, okay, sorry. Go ahead, Brian. I was just going to say I wanted to just thank Megan for all the work that she's doing yes. and say that you know I I am sorry that these things Absolutely. are happening. And I'm glad that she's bringing attention to all of these yep. difficulties. I think that there are many more places, uh, particularly some rural places um, where things might get worse like this. Um, and I think it's important that we recognize that. Yeah. Here, here. And, and I also don't buy the idea that viral load is predicting severity of the disease when uh, the vi viral inoculum predicts severity, severity of disease. But um, if, if we're discussing that, that's really kind of down in the weeds from the real fundamental problem here, sure. which is this whole misinformation pandemic, as Megan very accurately describes it. Um, and I'm Megan, I'm really sorry you're dealing with this. And it sounds like this is this is an awful situation. I'm I'm also sorry to hear that you're thinking of leaving that area, which desperately needs people like you to be there to take care of the people who are doing idiotic things and getting themselves sick. Um, I, I don't have any good recommendations for the situation except to kind of keep 
plugging away and and understand that you're you're probably getting through to some people who mm. will maybe take seriously the the need for physical distancing and yes the need for masks as well um but unfortunately this has turned into this whole culture war stupidity that people just aren't going to be reasoned out of i have a suggestion Agreed. vote vote there yes that is there you go i think <laughs> that is whole, something you can do that is something everybody the can. whole sure, the whole sure. polarization about masks and who gets infected and who doesn't started from the top of yes. this administration and it could have gone this another exactly way right. entirely you know tony fauci was trying to get the message out but he's he's muffled and that's where the blame lies for this in my opinion uh, so uh, 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 my question is has the damage been done if the administration turns over? It's so polarized yeah, I know. that even if we get Good point. an appropriate voice from the top, is that going to be effective? Uh, or, good question. Or are we so dug in at this point? Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know the answer. Back? I don't know the well, answer. It, it, if they close the bars in Texas, that's going to drive a lot of people to realize that this is more serious than they originally thought. Oh, no. All, it does, so? is All it does is piss them off. We've already been there. <laughs> no, I know that, but no, the bars are closed now. Where are they going to go? Yeah. Uh, won't, okay, so <clears throat> electing better management, which we desperately need to do. I mean, the Trump has comprehensively failed as president and needs to be fired. You know, whatever you feel about the details of Biden's platform, you, you can't do worse than what we've got. And that's the change that's needed. Um, it certainly will not erase the divisiveness of American politics that has been growing for the past 30 years, um, fed more by one party than by the other. But that the point is we've gotten to this situation through a series of bad decisions. And here we are. And I don't think that electing Biden is going to erase the the partisan nonsense any more than electing a black president erased racism. Okay? No, it's just no. Changing the president is not going to fix a but systemic problem. But it will problem. have a president who says we need to wear face masks and do this and this. That helps, right? What it helps, it helps in a couple of ways. First of all, that the most prominent advocate would be presumably taking responsibility for things and advocating on the basis of more often science rather yeah. than than you know some random thing said on twitter um and in addition the president let's remember this has power okay yeah. <laughs> this this is the most powerful office in the world and that person is capable of making decisions that have far reaching impacts um that lead to either good or bad or less bad outcomes and that's what we're seeing right i mean we're seeing the culmination of four years of horrible decisions right now and if you get somebody in there who's going to make less horrible decisions then we're going to get less horrible results i think uh, picking the right people at the t second and third tier levels has yes. a huge impact also and that's the presidential sphere that we're dealing with right now because if the cdc is undermined by a rumor and by misinformation then that affects everybody else down the ladder until it finally gets to your local health officer the, yes. the, the public health officer of this little town is affected by what happens at the top of the cdc which in turn is affected by what people think about science versus religion or yes. some other non-scientific uh, basis for knowledge and uh you're always going to have this doubting public that that that's present always uh, it happened during the flu epidemic of 1918 and it's happening now it happened in the polio epidemic i'm sure of it vincent you've got lots of examples of people refusing to get the vaccine and calling it hearsay and why did they close my swimming pool and all this other stuff and um yeah, that's my rant. Brianne, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, all, all I will say is that I um, am sure that I am preaching to the choir and that our listeners already know this. Um, but um, I feel especially given a comment that was made um, last night um, that we should just comment on the fact that um, the mask 
uh, issue was brought up in this letter and no masks do not increase um, fatalities. Masks are not dangerous. Wear, please wear your masks. Yeah. And again, I know our listeners already know that, but it needs to be said. I would former say Governor since- Christie has already said that in public <clears throat> after his recovery. Yeah. So maybe that'll have some effect, Alan. And and yeah. since the beginning of this discussion back in March, I mean, we we've discussed the science. Well, maybe masks effects are not that big, and maybe yeah, it's yeah, probably only yeah, protecting people from you if you're infected. But um, but the upshot of it is there is no downside, right? And and if you're using a I mean, bandanas have gotten kind of bad press, but it turns mm-hmm. out that the, that's better than nothing. Um, if you're covering your face with whatever random scrap of cloth you have around, <laughs> it respect. is better than nothing, and it costs you nothing, and it has no disadvantages, so do it. And it means you have respect for everybody else's health. Yes. Well, I would say if you feel that face masks – don't protect you against infection or protect others, then the next time you have surgery, tell your surgical team not to wear (laughs) face masks. That's right. That's right. Okay? And you see what happens. Unfortunately, our antibiotics are so great, but (laughs) that's why they wear face masks. I I very strongly suspect that, I mean, it's hard to dissect the real data out of this, but based on my observations of what's going on on the planet, I strongly suspect that the combination of masks, distancing, and hygiene is absolutely profound. It's, it's why the bumps go disease. down. Yeah, absolutely. When you follow the rules, the bumps go down. No, I, yeah. I yeah. think that's why we are, we're having a, another surge now. Yeah, absolutely. Because all, uh, the, surges, the surges and the quenching of that are all proportional know, behavior, I think. Maybe on ESPN we should have a oh, come on man about all the things that are going on. No, it, it, it might it might reach a lot more people. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Nick Saban can help us. Uh, ah, he might become a poster child for all of this. Indeed, indeed. indeed, um, indeed. Yeah, I think the surge is people lax about face masks and yeah. distancing, and I think yeah. the cooler they're, weather they're is playing tired. into it as well. Less they're humidity. Cool. So School tired. reopening yeah. and people having parties and reopening bars, and um, we're seeing it here in Massachusetts. I mean, yeah. we did a great yeah. job. That's right. We had an initial spike. We had a super spreader event. We had It was bad here, and we got it under control because we've got competent management, who's a Republican, by the way, um, but who believes yeah. in science. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Said, yeah. All right, yeah. we're shutting everything down. And we were doing great, and now the numbers are creeping back up. That's right. And it's because we're reopening things, and people are out and about. And you're all right. Yeah, we're we're having a, a spike here in New Jersey as well. And in fact, yep. um, this week, um, New Jersey qualified for its list of states that you need to quarantine um, when you come to New Jersey from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Massachusetts is is creeping up toward busting their own yeah. requirements as well. All right, so I'll add in my son who goes to Marist. He, um, They've had classes all semester in person. That's in New York State. Poughkeepsie. Right. Uh, this week, they've had a jump in cases, so they've put all classes online. Wow. Uh, and the reason was uh, an off-campus party. Of Kids course. got infected, and they're, and they're randomly testing, and they've, they detected it. So... Kids get infected <laughs> and they transmit right. infected. Sure. Vincent, what do you think about the Chinese claim that they uh, tested 3 million people in two days? What if test did they possibly it, use? If anybody could do it, China yeah. could. Yeah, but yeah. what did they do? What, did, what was the know. test that they used? I don't used? know. I, I they need to see. They probably deployed 3 million people. I mean, they. The, the, <laughs> no, but. The thing with China is that staffing is never an issue. They well, just, I, I, they've I hear that. the people for whatever they need to do. I don't know. So they have a dipstick uh, test? I don't know what they have. Show me the journal article. Dixon, give me the journal I, I just, article. I don't, I don't question figures <laughs> like that on China. It's like, yeah, they've got a central government that can just say, do Look, this. Didn't they, they build, build, a, hospital uh, a, week, didn't they build a hospital in a week in the beginning? Yeah. 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 And we could never do that here. They'd still no. be arguing about the costs yes. after the first year. <laughs> they wouldn't have a building permit yet. No. That's right. All right. One more email here. Gerard writes, Dear Twiv, greetings from Nottingham, where it's cl- mainly cloudy with an expected high of 52. Thank you for your podcast, which has helped to keep me sane since March. Time has politicized COVID-19 in the UK as well. 
So your careful adherence to the yellow brick road of common sense is very welcome. It applies equally well in the UK. I found Daniel Griffin's careful evidence-based explanation of Donald Trump's experience particularly enlightening. Maybe if the president were to listen to it, Jay wouldn't stand for jackass. Oh, those Brits, they're so tough. (laughs) (laughs) Today, Nottingham has become the city with the highest SARS-CoV-2 infection rate in the UK with 689.1 cases per 100,000 people in the past week. Cause for alarm and a call to action. Surely our government's reaction is to say, we'll decide what to do on Monday. Today is Thursday. Four days of doing nothing different means four more days of increased infection rates. Local government has urged us to shelter in place, but can't unilaterally close schools, bars, and non-essential businesses. Our own jackass and his minions... (laughs) have spoken (laughs) glibly of playing whack-a-mole with SARS-CoV-2. The mole appears to be winning. Just a couple of other things, if I may. I was delighted that Vincent chose Adam Neely's Girl from Ipanema as a pick of the week. It's a really interesting video, and Adam is great. It is interesting. Adam's latest video of children's songs is just a joy. This video astonished me. He provides a link for that. I appreciate there may be reasons for not broadcasting this, but Daniel Griffin mentioned that Parasites Without Borders is supporting Microbe TV until the end of November. I haven't heard you mention it on TWIV, and I'm worried that you're not maximizing every dollar. In the UK, (laughs) we are brought up to believe this is an un-American activity like diffidence and bad teeth. (laughs) (laughs) Stay thoughtful, stay reasonable, stay grumpy, stay healthy, Gerard. So actually, I read Gerard's email... um, a week or so ago, and and I hadn't mentioned Daniel's fundraiser, so I started mentioning it because of you, Gerard. Yes. Uh, I had thought, ah, I don't want Thank wanna. you for correcting us on that, Gerard, and you're right. That was that was un-American of us. <laughs> that was great. I, I've been to Nottingham uh, many times because a very good friend of mine who I used to collaborate with sometimes for trichinella research worked at the University of Nottingham, and he took me the first visit to their bar of all bars. It was the very first tavern in England. It's called the Road to Jerusalem, as I recall. And in the inside of this is a cave. It's it's underneath the castle in Nottingham where the sheriff lives. Hmm. And the walls, you can actually, Vincent, you'd love this, you can actually culture the original yeast that they used to brew the beer off of the wall of this thing. And it dates right back to 1110 or something like that when the Crusades began. And that's where they all got drunk before they headed off to the Middle East. So they have a rich history of uh, hmm. pubbing and the pubs of Nottingham are charming and it's hard to resist them. And I can understand why someone's entire social life disappears with the stroke of a pen it says, I'm sorry, you can't go there anymore because you're going to get sick. And called ye, only, it's called ye old trip to Jerusalem. That's the one. That's the one. And I've it's been got there. a wiki. It's got a Wikipedia page. <laughs> I've been there. I don't. Eight. I don't see you on the Wikipedia page. Oh no, well, I was underneath a table. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it a, a nice looking pub. It's a charming place, and it's something. It's a a tourist attraction. Everybody wants to go there and get a beer. Yeah, it backs um, up to this cliff, I guess, and is dug into it. Hmm. Yeah, it's a. It's it's hard for the societies of England to stay away from pub life. And I think that's probably the idea here. They're just yep. sick and tired of it all. Mm-hmm. And screw it. I'm not going to get sick or I will get sick, but I'm still going to go down to the pub. All right. So that's, it's a shame. Let's do some picks. Dixon, you're first. What do you have for us? Well, I have a television series that just began night before last. It's called The Age of Nature. And it's narrated by, of all people, Uma Thurman. And she does it very, very well. And it's about recovery, environmental recovery. There isn't a single negative story in any part of it. And it's only uh, the first part. uh, An awakening, it's called, when people realize that we're dependent upon nature. And here we are destroying the hell out of it. And so let's work towards repair. It shows some small repairs. And then it shows one enormous repair in China, the Los province. Uh, Los is, refers to a certain soil type that when the trees are gone and the wind comes in, the soil just blows away. It's so loose. And that was absolutely fixed by people mm. doing hand labor over a 10 to 20 year period, planting trees, um, 
conserving water in various ways and planting the right crops. And, in, and it showed these time-lapse photographs of a completely denuded set of mountains. And then over a 10-year period, you can see all of the growth of the plants that used to be there coming back. It was very, very uplifting and extremely encouraging that it's not hopeless. That's the point I'm trying to raise here. It I'll have to... Uh, Hopeless. I'll have to show this to my uh, grandchildren. We watch nature oh, shows, nature shows after school this. in our schoolhouse, and the I don't know if you remember Rich the uh, the island uh, series that was on recently. Oh sure, sure. Would have all of this beautiful stuff about the islands, and then the people would come and they trash the place. Exactly. And, and my uh, my grandson was like, by the by the second or third episode <laughs> of this, the people would come and he would go. Oh, no. Not again. <laughs> Not again. <laughs> That's right. That's right. right. So well, they'll, they'll appreciate this. They'll in this case, this. the people came and they repaired what they damaged. All right, good. Dixon, isn't uh, her father a professor at Columbia? I don't know that. I do know that I once had the thrill of a lifetime. It was a bar on uh, and a restaurant on uh, Broadway. Um and I'm blocking on the name, but they had If two you're noticing locations. a theme with Dixon, that's okay. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I've lived long enough. <laughs> I've had a good time. And I actually sat at a table next to Uma Thurman and her person that she was talking with. I don't know whether it was her husband or her agent or whatever. And I just, you know, pretended that I didn't notice her. And I kept trying to go like this. <laughs> her father is Robert. Quite, quite a, quite a, quite a, her father is Robert Thurman. Th Thurman. He was the J. Song Kappa Professor of Indo-Tibetan Buddhist Studies at Columbia before really? retiring in June 2019. I'll be oh. darned. I'll be darned. There you go. This is a lovely, lovely series. Thank you, Dixon. Excellent. You're welcome. You're welcome. Brianne, what do you have for us? Um, I have some items um, from an Etsy shop. The Etsy shop is called Science on a Postcard. Um, but they are some pins that I thought that um, my fellow co-hosts and listeners might enjoy. Um, so there are some that say virologist, which you can't really see here. It's cute. Um, there's a virologist. Ooh, very nice. Um, there's one that says immunologist. <laughs> oh, good. Tougher um, sell, but <laughs> there's one that says science communicator. Ah, um, there's also you. one that says vaccines cause adults, um, which I cannot currently find. Vaccines cause adults, <laughs> um, <laughs> among many other things, and some That's you know funny. great little earrings and just lots of things cool. that uh, are right up everyone's alley. Uh, nice. Rich, nice. you had have a D four phage on them. They look they great. They do. They're they're really nice earrings. You had a vaccines cause adults t shirt last week, Rich, right? Uh, yeah, that's uh, my daughter sent me that. That's one of my favorite T-shirts. Gets lots of. Actually, I'm pleased. It gets lots of uh, thumbs up when I walk Good. around uh, with it. People see that they like it. I don't walk around anywhere, so I wouldn't 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 wear one. Um, I don't know if you notice if you drive around neighborhoods, there are signs on people's lawns. You know, a healthcare hero works he lives here, right? So my wife said, "Why don't you put a sign saying a virologist lives here?" <laughs> <laughs> but those are a little small, Brianne. I need a bigger one. Okay. I'm afraid they'll trash it. Somebody will rip it off, right? Because it's truth. Mm. It's science. <clears throat> Alan, what do you have? I have a blog post on a blog that if people aren't already following it, they probably ought to be. Uh, it's called Southern Fried Science. Um, <laughs> how can you not follow a blog that's got that in the title? But this is a it's a marine biology blog. Um and this is a, a neat little article about an aspect of vaccine manufacture that we virologists probably don't think about a whole lot. Um, there's an adjutant that's used in many vaccines, including some of the ones that are now being that are now in clinical trials for SARS-CoV-2 called squalene, which comes yes. from shark liver. Yes. So <clears throat> how many shark livers are we going to need to vaccinate the world <laughs> with a vaccine <laughs> containing squalene? And uh, there's there's stuff circulating on uh, social media, I guess, about people being very concerned that we're going to kill too many sharks in order to vaccinate everybody. And what this post points out is mm -hmm. um, we already kill way more than enough sharks to do this uh, for a lot, much less good reasons. Um, and uh, has the depressing statistics that uh, that currently 100 million sharks a year get caught and killed for fins. Just for meat. the fins. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
which is completely optional. Um, but if you just harvested the liver from a tiny fraction of those, and then there's already a market for this um, for this adjuvant um, that uh, would would easily fill the demand. There's also squalene can be can be produced in plants, and there's plant based squalene that's chemically equivalent that can be used for this. So this is not a cause for concern, but it is an interesting um, aspect of vaccine manufacture. Um, this is not the only mm -hmm. uh, type of component that we that we use in science that we never really think much about where it comes from. That's true. It's not possible to um, synthesize, synthesize this. It, it is it, C. Uh, yeah, I think you could probably synthesize it, but the plant-based form is going to be the better source of it. Oh, sure. sure. Um, it's a it's a large complex molecule. Yeah, it's a it's a C thirty H fifty, and it's just basically yeah. a linear. Hydrocarbon, lots of yeah. carbon bonds, straight. There are no circles. There's no dihydroxy right. chicken wire, Dixon. But it's big. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's on its way to dihydroxy chicken wire. Yeah, it's, it's, it's getting there. And it's and true. the fact that you can isolate it from plant sources means yeah, absolutely. And also, you know, we're already killing all these sharks, so we've got plenty of shark liver that's going to be sitting around. Um, this is not going to be a big issue. Uh, so if you have this seen this particular concern raised, um, that's not something to worry about. But something to worry about is we're killing 100 million sharks a year. Maybe we shouldn't be doing that. Huh. It's also an also, olive oil. It's just cool to know. It's just really cool to know about. Yeah. <laughs> the, by the way, the Age of Nature had a segment on Bikini Atoll. Mm -hmm. And a marine Boy, biologist we went place, back though. to see what it was. How, what became of it? And they expected it to be a sterile. Uh, no way, man. Coral reefs all over the place and lots of sharks. Lots of <laughs> the, sharks. The coolest nobody's story. Nobody's been diving there. Coolest exactly. story. Remember when Krakatoa blew up, right? Oh, there was God, this yes. little bit. Well, no, I'm not that old. I, I don't remember that. There was this little <laughs> bit of uh, dirt in the ocean, completely naked, and then... 30 years later, it was completely populated with all sorts of plants that had come in sure. one way. It's amazing. Uh, yeah. Nature is quite resi resilient. That brings to mind. Well, that's the whole basis for this show. As a kid, I, I read a book called the Some, Something Balloons, 37 Balloons or something like that. Mm. I have to get it next time for a pick. It's all about a, it's an imaginary story that takes place on Krakatoa. Oh uh, Rich Condit, what do you have? Uh, I have a link to the sixth annual Science Mill Benefit, Navigating the In-Between, the Future of Science. I think some time ago uh, I had as a pick of the week uh, this um, hmm. institution uh, in Johnson City, Texas, about an hour from here called the Science Mill hmm. that uh, was set up uh, and is run by uh, our friend Nels Eldie's parents. Okay. Uh, that uh, and I've been out there. I guess you haven't been there, uh, Vincent. No, I have not. I've been out there. It's a uh, you know, this is a retired couple with um, uh, too much energy, and uh, <laughs> you know, wanting to know what to do with their uh, time and resources. And uh, this is uh, mostly uh, uh, Nels's mom. Uh, she's the prime prime mover in this, though they're both involved and set up this delightful facility uh, in an old, essentially an old barn of some sort. Well, how's that uh, figure that, into crowdsourcing and stuff and um, uh, crowds well, the in general? Deal is, uh, the deal is that they have a fundraiser every year, okay? And uh, recently, and their fundraiser is on right now. Um, uh, let me see, did I do, this is linked here. Yeah, their fundraiser is on right now from October 15th through 18th. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it has to be virtual this year. It's usually yeah. uh, in person. Okay. Uh, and Vincent and I, along with Nels, recorded a little bit about pandemics. That's part of this, but they have a whole bunch of other uh, video links and other things that you can look at. And I'd just like to plug that and plug the science mill. And uh, some of you listeners out there have got a spare dollar or million if you could just uh, make a donation, uh, this is a worthy cause. Cool. Yeah, yeah. This nice. looks cool. I think I want to do the uh, 360 uh, virtual reality tour. Yeah, uh, yeah, I haven't done that yet, but it's a, yeah, you'll get a you'll get an idea of the facility. It's it's really a delightful facility. Very imaginative. They've got a good nice. crew working with them. Nice. Cool. 
They do a lot of outreach too. That's one of their major things is they send staff out to school and stuff and they have uh, STEM programs for, for schools and they also do field trips. Schools can come to the museum. So it's very much an outreach thing. They're, they're uh, very active as uh, promoters of uh, science in the Austin area. Cool. Excellent. So our, our video, is it up yet or? Yeah, it is. There. Okay. Yeah. It looks like that's the first one. Um, okay. Cool. Series. All right. My pick is uh, The Evolution yeah. of Infectious Disease by Paul Ewald. It's a good book. It's a great book. book. Now, this is a classic. I just, uh, I got the original purchase receipt here for when I purchased it on oh my de December 2009. He should update the version now. He should, but um, there are some concepts Sorry, in here. I, I've always been interested in, the, in how infectious disease uh, evolves and- um, Paul was is, uh, at Amherst College, and he, the first sentence of the book really summarizes it. He says, few ideas have been so ingrained in the literature of medicine and parasitology as the idea that parasites should evolve towards benign coexistence with their host. Few ideas in science have been so widely accepted with so little evidence. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure they're widely accepted, but that's one idea. And he goes through discussions well, thanks of to this it. book and Paul Ewald in general. They're not so widely accepted anymore. Yeah, that's but, true. Um, I think this is. I mean, some of the things are a little out of date here, but it's a good primer if you're interested in this topic. And I mean, in my opinion, and actually, not just my opinion, but the experiment of Mixoma release in Australia provides a great uh, example of how pathogens evolve in natural yep. settings but this is a really cool book and i have here on my right you I know mean, i put all my virology books next to me so i could grab them <laughs> and this one i was looking at today and i said this, this should be my pick but i have lots of a lot of cool books here that uh i can use i'm home today the virus on the cover i'm I home was today that's the same thing is there a credit for the cover photo you know, it's a very interesting virus because it's clearly enveloped and the the, the spikes are rather thick uh, in proportion to the remainder. So usually the cover is described right on the copyright page. It's usually right? something that everybody knows about also. <laughs> or maybe it's on the back um, back cover. No, it's not. Anyway, there's the uh, virus on the cover. Let's get it to – no, I don't have autofocus here. I'm sorry. It's um, I don't know what it is. It's uh, it's right. got a really thick uh, spike layer. Uh, now you got me there. Who asked me, Dixon? <laughs> Dixon. I did. The only non-virologist in the group asked that question. Why well, you I always you ask? Guys would uh, come up with a cogent response, but apparently not. <laughs> well, that just goes to show that at the level of electron uh, microscopy, it's it's hard to. This is not a tool we usually use to identify viruses. <laughs> no, no, this is true. This is true. I mean, you could distinguish still. enveloped and, and of course, non-enveloped. And if the virus happens to look like a solar corona, <laughs> you can. <laughs> in fact, when SARS-CoV-2 was first looked at in the EM, they said, well, it looks like a coronavirus. Mm -hmm. But what is it? They, they have no indication of what it, this is. And I cannot tell. Paul up and ask him. <laughs> <laughs> looks pretty big. Yeah, it does look kind of big. And you you, you found a copy online, I presume, Rich, right? Yeah, I'm looking at the, actually, the link has the, uh, you know, the few pages. Huh. I'm going to have to have a look at this. You don't think it's, a, it's not a pox, it's too spherical, right? No, no, it's too spherical. Oh, Dixon, well, maybe you we got us. offer a prize for the person who comes up with the... <laughs> <laughs> to identify the virus. That's exactly the right. <laughs> what are you going to offer, see, Dixon? Uh, we've been clueless on a couple of uh, issues on this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is uh, maybe the episode title ought to be Clueless. Well, I bet maybe I'm thinking hepatitis B virus because I can almost see a, an icosahedral uh, capsid inside a, the envelope. Well, so they gave a Nobel Prize for the discovery of hep C, right? They did. Yes. yes. And for Hep B many years before, 1976. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's right, Bloomberg. All right. That's TWIV673. Show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIV. Email goes to TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to support us, you could go over to parasiteswithoutborders.com. There are 5013C, so your contribution is tax deductible, and they will match it. Otherwise, uh, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. 
Dixon DePommier is at parasiteswithoutborders.com and trichinella.org. Thank you, Dixon. Yes, thank you. It's a, this is, you know, hugely entertaining and informative. Does everyone think that Dixon looks better for, with his new camera? Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Smile. <laughs> oh, yeah. And we, I, I, love, I think his background, I, I like your background too. It's really, you got the paintbrushes, yeah. you got the flies. It's really good. It's love complicated. It. It's complicated. Yeah. It's, it's complicated. Yeah. It's okay. Uh, you got the little backlight. It's always good. Separate you from the see, background, see, you know. See, there you go. There okay. You go, there you go. Brian Barker is over at Drew University on Twitter, Bioprof Barker. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. Rich Condit's an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Alan Dove is at alandove.com on Twitter. He is Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>